Please be seated, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Ans, for being here. This is case number 2018-CA-5321-NC. Uh, NC. It is uh, Jack Kowalski, et cetera, et al. versus Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. Let's go ahead and take appearances, starting with the plaintiffs. Greg Anderson, Nick Whitney, Tom Elegant on behalf of the plaintiffs, Your Honor. Chris Altenburn and Patricia Crawls on behalf of John Hopkins All Children's Hospital. Okay. My suggestion, unless there's a better way of doing this, is just start on page one and uh, proceed. And I think Mr. Reyes is going to put the feed up, but I need to turn on his authority to do that. Uh, let me... There you go. You should have the authority now. And to confirm, we're working on what is called working copy of instructions November 1st, 23 at 2.15 p.m. Is that the ones we're using? Let us make sure. Your Honor, do I need to pop into the into your Zoom and then throw that over? Is that what we're trying I, to do? I need you to be able to put it up on the the monitors so that the TV folks can grab the feed. So I guess yes, the answer to your question. Okay. Chris, where's the timestamp on this set? I don't think there's a timestamp. They were just emailed yeah, yeah. into we have not been putting these in the record. In fact, at, at the end of the hearing, I was going to suggest that I don't know that there are any comments on the side that need to be redacted, but it might be simplest to just have my office create a PDF of this and do a notice of filing that this was what we discussed at wow. the hearing for preservation purposes. Greg, I'm going to forward it to you right now. Okay. I will say the following. Uh, on a going forward basis, my office is going to take control of making further changes Good. to the document. So <laughs> on a going forward basis, I will be the owner of that, both that, the jury instructions and the uh, verdict form. I'm confident that, that makes both parties happy. <laughs> and I know Mr. Reyes will get this uh, up on the uh, screen for the TV folks here momentarily. Yeah. Your Honor, while we're waiting, uh, obviously the, the couple things you have under advisement will impact some of the instructions. I didn't know if you were. I'm going to run it in just a moment. Okay. You can take notes on rulings and things like that. I can. I can. Well, while Mr. Reyes is working on that, this is what we're going to do with the two uh, directed verdict motions that are. Um, no, I know, but I can do it for free. I don't want to, I don't want to go over that. Yeah. Right. The, the, what I'm going to do for the two directed verdict motions is I'm going to continue to maintain them uh, under advisement, and I am going to allow um, them to go to the jury, but technically I will keep them under advisement. So we need to uh, have the verdict form and the instructions with the instructions for those two counts and places on the verdict form for those two counts. So that's how I'm going to handle. Thank you, Your Honor. That, that, there are drafts of those in there. At this point, I'm going to go ahead and oh, I think Mr. A is uh, just had success. Okay, the uh, first thing I guess is on page four. I believe that's correct, Your Honor. Um, the, it is entirely proper for a lawyer. We're going to put that where we normally would put it. It's not going to get hot billing. Well, the just only, go. only reason I asked for that was that, I mean, that this case has been a little unusual, but that this issue has come up repeatedly as recently as yesterday afternoon. I. It's, it's not normally in a spot that's highlighted, but I accept the ruling. The, the instructions contain an instruction that says all the instructions are important and follow all of them. So I'm just going to put it where it normally goes. Um, page five. 
now. Well, wait, there, right after that, there's the during the trial, you've heard evidence about policies and whatnot. And I'm not 100% sure there's agreement on that, but I thought there was. Oh. I, I assumed if it was not highlighted or in a different color that it was agreed to. Was that an incorrect assumption? No, that, that should be a correct assumption, Your Honor. I think I think this is where I think we end, this is where we ended up on this one. Yeah. So then on page five is the during the trial you've heard testimony. Okay. So um, my thoughts there, where it says the order ended the lawsuit in the dependency court at the end. Should I also not add the statement in all existing orders? That order ended the lawsuit in the dependency court in all existing orders, period. I, I, I have no objection to that. I wasn't sure you wanted that, so I didn't put that there. Orient me again, Chris. Uh, uh, on, on page five, top the first full paragraph at the very end, the sentence says, the order ended the lawsuit right. in the dependency court, and your honor wishes to add what additional language? I'm, you'll, I'm sure you'll get it right. I'm trying to figure it out. And is that order by any chance going to be, uh, is the court ever going, going to consider revising the original instruction on dependency court orders that was read um, halfway through? Well, we had a couple points if we ever get to that. I mean, I, I think I told everybody when I came up with that, that if there was slight revisions we need to make before it gets into the final version, I would be willing to entertain that. That was my understanding, Your Honor. I'm, I'm not asking for anything. I would say that the final order in that dependency court is one of those, it's a plain vanilla one sentence order. Well, in any event, what, for, for this top paragraph, um, talking about the order to administer ketamine, I was gonna leave that paragraph in and add the clause and all existing orders at the end of that sent the, the last sentence of that paragraph. And then I was going to leave in the next paragraph during the trial. You have heard testimony about stress related. I was going to leave that in. In the following paragraph, that uh, yellow highlighted language, to be clear, I was going to remove uh, those sentences that were highlighted in yellow in yellow so are you are you going to actually that whole paragraph then I think would come out including the in these instructions and then we would pick up with plaintiffs think the standard instruction well, no, that, that, that's just a comment that would come out. Yeah, okay. I, 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 I believe that, that everything from the in these instructions down to the next request, which is the plaintiff's request for an adverse inference, I think that whole nine yards could okay. come out. Okay, I, I am fine removing the, the, the two sentences above the written in yellow language. Right. It, isn't that repeated later on anyway? Yes. More yeah, okay, that's what I thought. Yes, about yes. nine times. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. Let, let, let me pause it. I'm going to ask Mr. Reyes a question. Um, Mr. Reyes, when I am reading the instructions to the jury, I'm going to want either you or Mr. Cottrell to put them up uh, so the, the general public can also see them. When I, So I'm going to ultimately have to send... You or Mr. Cottrell, a, a copy is it? Would you need it in PDF form, in Word form? How, how is it going to be the easiest? And I'm going to make it large enough so I can see. So you're not going to be able to put like the whole page, or I guess you could, but um, you know, if you want to make it large enough so everyone can read it, probably you only get like a third of the page on the screen at any one time. So how should I send it to you? PDF format. PDF. Okay, perfect. Okay, let's go back to the, the jury instructions. So this takes us to the top of page six and the question uh, for adverse inference. Uh, Mr. Elegate, I'm gonna let you talk on this, but my working thought is 
I am not going to give this adverse instruction. So since it's against, I'm going to be ruling against you on this point, uh, give it your, your best shot. Your Honor, this is a hold uh, instruction. To, and really, and I, I pre, I, from, from the updates I've been getting, it sounded like there was some question of whether something had been lost. And then, well, maybe it wasn't. But then what I heard late yesterday, it sounds like there's still going to be some, some documents coming in that are going to be considered by the parties in the court that would show, well, was there something that should be there in terms of reviews or counseling and so forth? And if that turns out to be the case and, and they're not there, then we would want the instruction. If there's, if there's no factual basis, then obviously we, we wouldn't request it. Even if there's no written evidence of those two prior in, in, instances of counseling, you already have the, uh, the reprimand that references those two prior instances. So the fact of those prior uh, counseling uh, issues with respect to Ms. Speedy is already in front of the jury. Um, and I'm assuming that we're ultimately going to get the policy. Uh, I think we already put in the policy that talks about progressive discipline. Uh, and, and ultimately, I, I'm struggling with the concept of, you know, is, is, is that really more of a collateral issue? Uh, what is that adverse inference going to give as far as a, a specific cause of action and an element in a specific cause of action? So that's why I'm, I'm pretty, pretty much against this uh, adverse instruction. Uh -huh. I understand. I think I lack a little bit of the, I don't know what's going to be, I don't know what was produced last night or what's going to, or maybe was produced this morning or is going to be produced. So I don't know what the ramifications of that may be, if anything. So I, on that factual matter, I think I'd have to defer to Mr. Anderson and Mr. Whitney as to whether this is still in play or might still be in play, depending on what else is produced. Well, I mean, obviously, and this is why I wanted all the evidence to be, be closed so we didn't have to change things on the fly on Monday, but circumstances uh, warrant us not uh, closing the evidence yesterday. So, you know, we, we might have to make a change on the fly. That's well, won't be the first yeah. time we've had to do that. No, I, I and your honor, with, uh, I think everybody has a word of, I mean, if, if you wanted to take that and set it to the side and, and if it's going to come back in, it's easily reinserted with whatever it would need to be tuned up depending on what, what the issue, you know, what the document missing document was. Well, for now, I'm going to take it out. I understand. And your honor, uh, practically speaking, then that will not affect our ability to make the arguments, not for adverse inference, but the fact that things are missing. Well, judge, we will be objecting I, to that. If, if I, I, well, I just did. experience, but. I, I need us to stay focused yeah. on the jury instructions, and, and I cannot have us go into 4,000 different permutations of what ifs. Understood. I, I just, we don't have time anymore. Okay. Um, I think we're going to, instead of calling it intentional restraint, I think we're going to recast it to say false imprisonment. Yes, Your Honor, I think we had, we agreed to that. On, on the title, you mean? On the title. Yeah. And now now there, there's some, some language within. In the body, we had used the, the standard language about intentional restraint, I believe, on occasions, and then I had a sentence that said, this claim is sometimes called false imprisonment. There was a time when, when, when we actually had false imprisonment throughout because the plaintiffs wanted that, so I don't have strong feelings. Uh, we're we're good with false imprisonment, Your Honor, and I, I think that takes us to page nine. Was the next yes. highlighting that I saw? And, and, um, and this is just because I'm not really sure on the false imprisonment that I heard any evidence about hospitalization for the false imprisonment for injuries caused by that or, or the like. And I, I'm, I'm not anxious to have a lot of things where the jury has to think through about, gee, was there any evidence on something the judge gave me instructions on this? So I, I'm, there are a few of these where I'm trying to narrow down the description of the damages. And, and on that one, I'll go to Mr. Anderson or Mr. Whitney 
for uh, we've removed some other things in, in other places, but, but on this one, I didn't know what the evidence was. Mr. Anderson. Uh, off the top of my head, I don't recall that the life care plan had actual hospitalization. It did make reference to treatments and possible inpatient treatments. So that may still qualify. I guess we're talking about wording here. I'd like to leave it in simply because of the details in the life care plan. Yeah. Okay, but, but this is with respect to the, the false imprisonment claim, not your other claims. So just false imprisonment. Because I, I think for other claims, this language definitely is in for other claims. But for false imprisonment, alone, is she going... Is Maya Kowalski going to need future hospitalization? Is there evidence that she's going to need future hospitalization or she's lost the ability to earn money um, because of the false imprisonment? The, the three days in the hospital. Well, the, the problem we have, and perhaps the court is correct, I'm sure the court's correct, that a omnibus statement of these damages elsewhere would cover it, but obviously this is for a number of things added together that uh, totaled up into the, the entire harm to the plaintiff. And that, that's where we're going. He wants, he wants an aggregate damage, I, and he can't have that. I'm not aware of any evidence, Judge, okay. that's been submitted. My, my view of expensive hospitalization, nursing care, and loss of the ability to earn money with respect to the false imprisonment, it, it, it's not going to come... I'm not going to instruct on it. Now, I will instruct on it in other counts. Yes. Uh, but for false imprisonment only, uh, I'm going to remove. Oh, I need to do this in the room. Okay, the next, I believe it's the bottom of page 12, the top of page 13, it's the same kind of issue for battery. The batteries involved here are Miss, Miss Beatty hugging and giving attention to Maya, Maya Kowalski that she found offensive. And then the, uh, whatever, the batteries involved in the incident where the photographs were taken. And again, I'm not a aware of a lot of these damages of hospitalization, medical care, nursing care, loss of earnings of money, that there's evidence that would allow the jury to award this. Well, I think disability or physical impairment stays in. Um, but is there evidence of um, hospital or medical or nursing care or ability to earn money? Well, you've got the hospitalization at Arnold Palmer, uh, uh, which I believe we have bills in for. And again, I, I emphasize, and I, I confess I don't know this as well, I haven't concentrated on it, but I do have concerns about the defense arguing later, if we take this out, that that cannot be included in any further consideration, in any further instructions uh, down the road. Okay. Judge, we understand we, we, this. Mr. Yeah. Anderson. We are sharpening our pencil yeah. today. There, there's no more, we're, we're going to write with a really broad brush. We have to get this done. So yes, there, there, I don't recall evidence, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, that because of the battery, Maya Kowalski incurred hospital expenses 
nursing care or the ability to earn money in the future? Defense concurs. I, I cannot off the top of my head. So for battery, um, the hospitalization and, and, and medical will be out. Nursing care will be out. And the ability to earn money will be out. The language, when I say out, meaning I will not instruct on them. And let's, let's go on to Let's go to page 14. I, this, that I put in because it was your ruling. I was just making. I'm so sorry, where? Oh, well, at the bottom of page 14, the officers, directors, or managers was the result. Well, of, well, no, before we get there. Oh, okay. I, I, I want to ask, um, at the end of the top paragraph, Uh, that, that, that top paragraph talks about what the jury does um, if they have found um, a qualifying issue for us to determine punitive or to, to consider punitive damages. Do we then need a sentence at the conclusion of paragraph one that says, if you do not find one of those qualifying offenses, you do not consider the issue of punitive damages. So for instance, yes. um, I, I, I've sketched out uh, the following sentence, if I can read my handwriting. If, on the other hand, you do not find for Maya Kowalski on either false imprisonment claim or the claim of battery on January 6, 2017, then you will not address um, this uh, additional claim or, or, or something along those lines. And, and I agree, especially in this case, since it's only involving two of the many claims that that would be a good thing to put in, I guess. Because, yeah. you know, I, w I want these instructions to be accurate but also balanced. I... I if we're going to tell them if, you, if, if something on one hand, but if on the other hand, I think we need to have the complementary instructions. Agreed. So. Yes. Your Honor, that's fine. And, and on the verdict form, that, that's the way they will be directed as well. Yeah. On the verdict form, we actually said we separated them out count by count. It, it was harder on the verdict form than on in the instructions to combine. The next additional phrase I might am considering is in the third paragraph and it's the second sentence the sentence that begins if you decide that punitive damages are warranted yes I want to we will then we will proceed to the second part of that issue and then add the following clause after you finish deliberating so I propose it to read we will proceed to the second part of that issue after you finish deliberating, during which the parties may present additional evidence. I'm trying to... I actually I actually thought about putting that language there and decided it was non-standard, so I didn't type it in. <laughs> but I agree with that, that it, the standard would be better with that. Any, any problem with that, Mr. Elegant? No, Your Honor, I understand what's going on. I'm just, I'm looking at it to see if they're going to, if they're hearing that, what that's, I mean, we all know that if they say yes, they're coming back for a phase two, and that that's what you're trying to convey. I'm just, I, I, I need the jury to understand that if they check yes on the punitive damages, there's going to be another phase to the trial. Right. Right. They're going to hear more evidence so they can decide that issue. Because when, these are, read, when these are read, they don't really understand there's not going to be a damage line. Right. On, on and, and, and because there is no damage line, I don't, I don't want them to be confused as to, well, do I need to add punitive damage money into a compensatory line item? And, and so what is the language the court's proposing? 
I, I wrote down after you finished deliberating, I mean, I'd have to, you know, type it in to see if it flows properly, but something along those lines. Okay. Um, and then I was going to leave in the language I had previously said, the officers, directors, or managers. All right. Your Honor, I wonder if it should say, after you finish deliberating and, and return the, the verdict form, I will give you in a few minutes, something like that. Uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll, I'll work on the language, I'll wordsmith it, but the concept I will add. And yes, I'm just, I'm just thinking they'll know, because your, your comment about, or the comment about there won't be a line on there made me think of that, that maybe they, you know. Yeah, yeah, so we would like to see something in the event you decide uh, in, in favor of punitive damages or however you want to phrase that, you will receive additional evidence. I'm told the smoke smell is not a fire. It's just somebody with a microwave too long. Okay. okay. I was getting hungry. I could smell food. I was <laughs> well, I smell the smoke. Yeah. That's oh, Okay. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, it does say right after that, the parties may present additional evidence and argument. So I, I may cover it. Okay. So, I think Greg's right, but I think it's there. Let's move on. Um, I'm going with the second PCA um, right. language for definition of manager as opposed to the what the defense wants, which is from other DCAs. Uh, I think the defense wanted either one, Your Honor. It looks like that was an alternative. No, I'm, I'm not going to object and, and, and say that one was better than the other. I was, there were two cases, and I gave you both. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, let's see here. That takes us to page, is it 17? Yes. Um, the, the top paragraph. Yeah. Remind me why this was. This is in blue. It's in blue because I typed it in. It's my recommendation, and I'm pretty sure that the other side doesn't want it. That's why they have the red lines ahead of it. But I, I, I just felt we, we, there's been there's been testimony from Dr. Sally Smith, but there's never been any real because we're so silent on Chapter 39. There's never been real explanation of of what role she plays in the CPT and 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 the, the extent to which the hospital has to coordinate with this. And that's why I put that here in, in front of the apparent agency part, because it, it it's important that the jury not be confused about that during closing argument. It, this is way beyond the evidence. So, well, the, it's not evidence, it's law. The, <laughs> well, it's not the way it's presented. The first paragraph, um, I, I am generally fine with, I think we need to, on that last sentence, remove the word service. So for the circuit. Yeah, that's um, a statutory term, and I, they, that's probably confusing, yes. Well, actually, I, we probably should change that to zone because that's what I, you know, the expert testified okay. was the, the terminology used. Yeah, I have, I have no objection to a different Thing that frankly it's always been confusing to me that the DCF circuits and the circuit court circuits are different circuits. <laughs> um, and then I think we need to add in 2016 and 2017 was Dr. Sally Smith. Okay. Um, the next paragraph will capitalize child protection team. I, I was okay with the next paragraph. Now, remind me uh, and talk to me about the excised in the third paragraph, the language excised. When we, we briefly discussed this earlier, you, you had indicated that you weren't bothered about discussing the, the services in the statute that related to medical diagnosis, but that you felt that the first telephone call had not been made as a, as a consultation under the statute. So there, there are two references in that statute to consultation this one that I've left here with the uh, red line excision is is one that I mean, not only do I think it may provide help for the first phone call, but more importantly, I think during 
what we've heard about the EEG room and all of that, we're hearing conversations that I think also involve a consult. So that's why I wanted that language. This is the paragraph, as the medical director, Smith was required to be capable of providing certain additional services. Doesn't that confuse what she was doing from the plaintiff's standpoint? Well, this is taken from the statute as part of her statutory duties. Your Honor, I think our problem is how does that go to, I mean, the issue for her is a parent agency, which is not, I mean, it's what the hospital held her out as doing, or she created the impression with the aid of the hospital. And the fact that she has these other statutory duties, in our view, doesn't really bear on that. She wasn't doing those for those reasons. But for example, yesterday, we had a witness on the stand to explain that Sally Smith was in a white coat when she was doing these services, not when she was an apparent agent of the hospital. And that's why we need this kind of thing. Well, I tend to believe that this blue language is an accurate statement of the law. And it is a instruction that would be required for me to give. So I'm going to give it. The red excised a child protection team may also provide consultation with respect to a child who is alleged to be abused. I'm going to leave that in. And then in the following paragraph, she was not providing these services as an agent of any hospital. I'm going to leave that language in. Now, when we go to page 18, that's when I start having a divergence of opinion as to whether the balance of those two paragraphs are appropriate. I would rather go back to the instruction I had given in the prior order about the Johns Hopkins. You know, the courts already determined Johns Hopkins made the call to the hotline and they had reasonable suspicion. Whatever the language I use, that's where I'm going to go back to. So I'm probably going to take these two paragraphs out that are on page 19 and go back to the language I previously instructed on. I think, Your Honor, a couple of them, going back up the line above that, this when she provided service in her role as medical director, she was not providing these services to agent hospital. I mean, how's the jury supposed to determine that? I mean, that's that's almost instructing them that she's not an agent. I tell you what, Mr. Elegant, I'll think about that a little bit more. Ultimately, what's going to happen, it will probably be sometime tomorrow. Hopefully sometime tomorrow, I will circulate a draft and then everyone can chop it up. You know, I kind of figure we're going to be working on this over the weekend, probably via email. Unfortunately, I think that's just where we're going to have to do it because I don't have the ability to. I mean, I guess I could convene a hearing on Saturday or Sunday in the courthouse. But, you know, how unpopular that would make me with all the support staff here. I think email works. Your Honor, while we're on this, we're starting to put stuff in from Chapter 39 and so forth. How about one that says they can't hold they couldn't hold Meyer longer than 24 hours? You know, well, I tried to write that instruction. It's about a page and a half. Again, when you see what I physically write. OK, then you can propose alternatives. But, you know, since I'm going to be in control of the document on a going forward, I think it's going to be easier for me at that point to because I will know precisely who's made what proposed change. And if I agree that we can add it or subtract whatever the proposed change is and we'll go from there. But for the record, that statute would have given us immunity for a 24 hour window of this. And I tried to 
to write that description rather like I tried to write one for you several years ago on the on the the, uh, the Baker Act. Baker Act, and it it just got too complicated to add the fifty pages, so I quit. Are, are, are you suggesting that you can't take what the legislature has written and put it into a, it, a, a, it, a instruction I can give to the jury? On this one for 24 hours, it was just easier to go with unreasonable and unwarranted than to try to get an instruction on that. Okay, um, page 18, and this, this is more an, a me issue. I have substantial difficulties with double negatives, so... We're going to rephrase, uh, in this case, it's undisputed that Dr. Sally Smith was not an employee. So it, it will probably read something about, in this case, the parties agree that Dr. Smith, uh, Dr. Sally Smith was not an employee of uh, Johns Hopkins Health Children's Hospital. Okay. It, it's just, I, I don't do well with double negatives. No, I, and I, although I, I use them all the time, but when I'm, Looking at it or trying to read it, it just is difficult. That moves us to is it page 20. Um, I'm assuming this is your comment, Mr. Altenburn. For this claim, the medical negligence must have been caused. Yes. This, is, this is not standard, but I... I, was, I realized because we have all of these other claims in here that where you can get these things that we needed to explain that the traditional medical mal malpractice is a physical injury. I, I think the standard's going to be okay, so I'm probably going to excise this language. Well, is Mr. Anderson going to be able to argue that the medical negligence caused a physical, has caused emotional stress because of various things not related to I, misdiagnosis I, or treatment of CRPS? Well, Isn't that for the jury? At some point, the jury gets to decide something. I, I, I'm going to go back to the standard okay. in instruction. Now, I know, and, and again, and I will preface this when we talk about the negligent infliction of emotional distress, I know the defense uh, does not want this. It does not believe there's evidence of it, and we have that multiple directed verdict motions. And so I've made the decision that we're going to include language in the instructions and um, the verdict form. So given that we're operating in that parameters, I'm not, I'm not, I would not find any waiver by Mr. Altenburn talking about this claim and agreeing to language in this claim because it's clear I have made a definitive ruling. So thank you. Is that, is that enough I, uh, I, protection of the record so we can just actually talk about? It, it is for me if it is for Mr. Elkin. <laughs> uh, yes. Now, um, my... You know, I, I'm. I think what I, I should do at this point is add the, the language that is proposed in pink. Interacted with Jack. What, what I'll probably say is interacted with Jack, or Beata Kowalski, or both. Um, I think I think that's probably a little bit more accurate. On page twenty three. I will. I think I'm going to remove the statement. You may not rely on evidence that she heard about an incident from another person when she did not actually see or hear the incident herself. I'm going to remove that. And again, I, I know specifically that's something that the defense disagrees with. Now, uh, with respect to. Um, Page 24, I do think that there would be evidence of expensive hospitalization in medical as well as nursing care and treatment. So I'm going to leave that language in. Let's go to page 25. Your, Your Honor, if I, I can just ask on the, the interacted with language, 
Okay. Uh, sorry, what, what page are you on? This is the, the top of page 22. The, the manner in which it interacted with Jack or Vieta or both of them, language. Um, if, if we're doing that and, and they don't have a physical injury, um, are, I guess I'm concerned about what you're going to do in the verdict form for this because normally there's a finding of, if they're combined, there's a finding of negligence for the first party on a on instructions on that, and then there's this claim, and I'm, so I'm, if, I'm only kind of bringing up. I think this creates issues on the verdict. That's if all. if um, you think that we need to have a further interrogatory finding based on the court's ruling on allowing um, this claim to go, I certainly would be open to that discussion. And Your Honor, I, the one observation I would make is. You know, because I know this came up late yesterday on pertaining this is that I mean Biata did die. I mean that's kind of the ultimate physical injury. But that's never been alleged as this or a part of this at all. I I, I, I mean I, I think there's issues. I mean there's certainly case law that talks about negligence with respect to suicide and how that that's very 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 limited on circumstances that uh, like inpatient or where there's a duty. Um, and so I hear what you're saying. I'm not sure, though, that the death itself is qualifying, given, okay. given the status of Florida law on the duty issue and negligence relative to suicide. So I, I, unless there's something else, I'm on page, top of page 25. And the, and the problem with this is it was that this is a special had to be pled and it wasn't pled for this count. And what, what says the plaintiffs? I thought these were in the initial and repled uh, facts. I need to get my eighth amended out. My my. My recollection is this issue was not pled for this count. So for now, I'm going to remove. If you can point to where it's pled, I can certainly add it back in. But for now, I. Oh, Your Honor, Your Honor, if I could, we're on 6C, right? Paragraph 117. These physical injuries and manifestations of psychological trauma included aggravation of her CRPS. Paragraph 117 of the Eighth Amendment complaint. Let me pull it up. Well, it continues on weight loss, worsening lesions, and so forth. Okay, so this is at DIN. What DIN are we at? Ooh, 2816. He is right that paragraph. 117 does say these physical injuries and manifestations included aggravation of her CRPS. I, I was looking at page one, um, paragraph 123 in the wherefore clause for something in the request for damages that included mm -hmm. aggravation, and I, I, it has to be in there, doesn't yeah, it? I, I did not see it there. Okay, well, doesn't it have to be in the wherefore? Perhaps when I was looking at it, I was just looking in the. Yeah. Well, wherefore clauses. I mean, my, my position is it's supposed to be in the wherefore yeah. clause, but, you know. Well. I mean, that's. Sorry. That's where you ask for damages. But. Yeah. Well, in, in, in an ideal world, yes. Um, but if we're talking about the question of notice, I, I am now looking at paragraph 117. So I'm going to change my ruling, and I will keep in the discussion of aggravation or activation at this point. Okay. Keep in. Now let's move on to um, the negligent training issue. And, and I, I guess has the plaintiffs changed their position at all on this, or are they still 
riding this horse. I think we want to ride this horse a little longer. And there's always JNOVs and other ways to deal with it, Judge, but I remain concerned that uh, you never know what you don't know. Well, you know? I, I will I, defer to the... Oh, sure. I, I, I have detected a, a shift from negligent training of doctors and healthcare providers to a more generalized staff. So let's talk about that because my, my inclination is to keep it to as it was pled, which is more along the lines of negligent training of doctors and healthcare providers. Your Honor, staff was pled. And, and again, I didn't hear this part of the testimony, but the reason we added it in here is because I understand there was some contention made that, that Ms. Beattie was not a healthcare provider, but was just staff. Okay, well, can you give me a, a paragraph? Oh, where staff is pled? Yeah. Yes. Hold in, on. In, for, Hold on. in this yeah. count, there were references to staff, but this count was this thing that had several different theories in it throughout. <laughs> and that's been the problem. When they started dropping this and dropping that, and, you know, negligent training of doctors is a, is a medical standard of care. Uh, be it a, uh, Ms. Beatty is a professional, but she's not a health care provider. She's not. And, and I... I'm not sure. I haven't heard anything that are complaints about the people in the cafeteria. Well, and, and, and then let me, and, and I know this is forecasting what's going to happen on Monday, but based on the discussion yesterday, if this joint commission finding of whatever it was, um, immediate jeopardy, and I think Mr. Whitney told me yesterday that the finding was based on a systemic issue at the hospital having to do with um, patient safety and, and organization and stuff that was not just failure to, I, he might have even said that there was a failure to, to train um, folks at the hospital as discussed. I mean, I, he, he, I, he did those opinions. I agree. And, I, I heard and, it yesterday. I don't think he, it should have come in. And all that discovery was done because you allowed it for evidence on the punitive damages claim at the end of the summer. This wasn't done because they needed more on, on this claim. They were ready to go to trial on this claim. They said a year ago, April. And so I, I, I was listening to that yesterday, trying to figure out what it was really relevant to. I I don't want to get into it because yeah. there's so many issues associated with it. But if this report comes in or some discussion about the report, I'm having to, in my mind, envision how the jury instructions are going to look and what the evidence is going to be. So, you know, I'm somewhat handicapped because... I think all of you know exactly what's going on, and I'm the only one left in the dark. So, I we we have a pretty good idea now, Judge, but we still await the defendants providing of documents well, that that's supposed to, receive supposed to happen now. this morning, and then the deposition is going to happen tomorrow. That that's correct, Your Honor. Yeah. Documents will be given this morning. So, I, I'm just I'm just in my mind having to formulate what the possible evidence is and how it impacts. And out of everybody in this room, I'm probably the one with the least amount of knowledge. Maybe, Ms. Carlos, you probably don't have the same knowledge as everyone else. But I have some. I have some knowledge. <laughs> I, I know some, but, but, but probably not the, the, the deep history no, on this issue. She, has, I understand. she probably has more than I do. Well, yeah, you, you probably also, Mr. Altman, probably don't have it. Mr. Elegant probably doesn't have it. But. I, uh, I'll confess. <laughs> uh, your Honor, while we're on this staff thing, uh, paragraph 193 in 14C incorporates some earlier paragraphs, among them 170, and one, which is a part of 14A, and 170 refers to competence of its medical staff and personnel. So, um, you know, again, we, we, we did plead staff, uh, plants did plead staff, um, and again, it continues on later when we talk about staff 
in some subsequent allegations that are incorporated. So that, that's why that came in. And again, I think I just heard this morning that, she, that she's not a health care provider. She's staff. So yeah. we, we're well, sitting here never been a health care provider. For the record, we moved to collapse the pleadings into the proof on that count. Quite. But we're sitting here at the <clears throat> end of trial. Everyone has rested and the plaintiffs have not provided something that would provide a, a, a training theory for the doctors as professionals under a medical standard of care by the medical committees that you believe may be responsible for this and a separate one for staff who are are negligent and they're citing cases about employees who are outside the scope of their employment or otherwise someone that someone's not liable for as an employer so i i just don't know where to go with this so i'll i'll, I'll stop Anything else, Mr. Elliott, that you? Uh, Your Honor, I have no problem with putting some language in, if it's not already here, that says, you know, if, if you're looking at the medical, you know, please refer back to what I told you about the medical malpractice standards. You know, there's no problem with that. Okay. Um, well, for now, what I'm going to do is, is keep in the reference to staff. Um, and if someone has objection to the language that I send around, hopefully tomorrow, um, I'm confident that you will, in, in legislative format, showing the strike throughs and additions, any sort of proposed changes. Um, I think on page 26, I was going to leave in the pink language. I do not have pink language. Oh. It's shaded on R and R's, I think, uh, Mr. Anderson. Oh. We did lose yeah, that, that it pink, looks pink to me, but the pink is only because I put a comment off to the side and pointing the out that I thought it demonstrated the problem with the, the whole concept. But it, it's Right now, I'm keeping that language out. Yeah. Um, and then the highlighted on page 27 in yellow, and <coughs> pink and yellow, uh, I was going to leave in, and I would leave in the staff reference as well. So I think that takes us to... I think the next thing is oh. damages on fraud. Page the, the fraudulent billing? Yes. Mm -hmm. but, but, I mean, I your, your comment was, I, I took it to mean, you know, you just disagree, but now that I've ruled. Well, I, I, I think the comment maybe reads longer than I, I bet that it's on the screen. It, 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 not only they failed to prove, but, I mean, Yes, his policy that year came with a deductible, and when he was on the stand, we, he was asked about whether this deductible would have been paid for all the other things that went on in his family during that year, and he had no idea. And, and the, the, from looking at the Etna run that's 900 pages long for these three years, it looks to me like even if you cut out all of everything from, from the hospital, the deductible was going to be gone. So there's no evidence that that there was a deductible that he was damaged by, and he pr produced no payment whatsoever of a copay from from any account, nor did he claim that he took it out of his billfold and paid it that way. So that none of that is here. I, I, I understand that you believe that this claim shouldn't go. I, I know that. I've ruled otherwise. Okay. But, but so the comment, I think, was more of a renewal of the DV motion as opposed to an alteration of the That's language. correct. If there were proof of all these things, that they, they could be on those lines. And but on on the, I'm not quite sure what we're doing with the, the land. Um, I, I I agreed that they didn't have to prove damages of that, but I don't know what the jury's going to do if they get a decision about any increase in insurance carriers' lien rights against the plaintiff. I, I, how are they really supposed to do that? Now, on page thirty where there was about eight comments. That's kind of where I started getting lost in what you all are trying to say. So let's talk about 
page 30. So who wants to go first? Your Honor, I think this isn't quite traditional, but I think in terms of dealing with a lien and the amount of a lien and so forth, that number C, you know, that is something that we understand the court would typically do after the fact. So in terms of that part, I think we're okay having subpart C come out. How about the pink language in A and B? Well, we were just talking about that. And you said that there was, that you were going to leave that in. So. Yeah, there was just too many comments there for me to. I understand. That's why I was trying to. Okay. So now we go to the intentional infliction of emotional distress survival claim. So I, I, I guess I, I'm not going to be as crisp because this is later in time and I've somewhat run out of time in my prep. So that's okay. This is, this I think is we're going to have, need to discuss the we're, we're going to have more discussions about the next few comments on, on that first paragraph. I think we agreed that we were going to use the, the language during the time that Maya Kowalski was a patient at the hospital. Am I, am I correct? Mr. Yeah, Elliott, that's that, fine. That, that that's, that's fine. fine. So the blue yes. and pink language in that paragraph, you all agree on? I, yes. Okay. So, then that takes us to the next page. Am I correct, or is there anything else? That's correct. The, the blue language on page 31. Now, in, in let's see, what, what was sent this morning? The only thing I sent, and I actually sent it shortly before midnight, I'm sorry, <laughs> um, what, was an effort on the suicide claim to, to put together something that would have both of those. Okay. So, so that's a wrongful death, not... That's not, the wrongful death. Okay. That's so not, I'll, I'll that's put that to the yes, side. And... Yes, there's no, there's no change in, in what... And here, what, I'm, what I've pointed out is, you know, if there's been all kinds of evidence in this case about maybe a, a, a negligent violation of the... Of the, in, the statutory bill of rights language or some internal policy or that we didn't put her name on a door and all of these things that they're being complained about, but they're not things that if, if analyzed would go to a jury as extreme and outrageous conduct without regard to whether it wasn't even intended to create a severe emotional distress on the part of Beata Kowalski. And so because there's so much of that in this case, there needs to be something that explains to them that there are some things they can't consider for this and, and a better description of what they can. And this was my effort to do that because, again, this normally there's, a, there's an incident, something that's a big trigger event that causes this in the case law. And this case doesn't have the big trigger. It's just got things going on for 100 days in the hospital. Uh, yeah. Um, Mr. Elegant. Your Honor, my comments are there in red that, you know, this is, I think the jury hears this and they're going to basically hear the court telling the jury, this is no big, there was just no big deal here. This was for the one important. Well, for Mr. Anderson, I can only have one person talk at a time. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, we just think, you know, these, these, these paragraphs are, are jury issues. It is all contextual, is what? the problem, Your Honor. It's yeah. all contextual. Any one of these things, you, pulling isolated facts out of a storyline and saying, well, we just think because we're, I guess, not the jury, that we should ignore this and then you should ignore that. This is completely and utterly for the jury to decide and telling them what they should consider to be 
outrageous under those circumstances is invading their province. You know, I object strenuously to anything that does that. So let me point and this out. This is a rather key count. Yes, and this is a key problem. And let me just use one example, if I may. The, the lady that, that my partner here so nicely explained had a nice hat. She came into the hospital and didn't register and was bringing this semi-sanitary icon into a hotel hospital room. Let's assume that was negligence on the part of the hospital to, to let her get in. But you can't take things that aren't themselves extreme and outrageous conduct. You can't take 14 little negligent things and say, oh, that equates to an extreme and outrageous conduct that intends. That's exactly what they're trying to do. This whole context is to tell this long story made up of things that individually cannot possibly qualify for this and then say, well, but if you put them all together, somehow they become an extreme and outrageous conduct. And that that's just not the law. And the jury needs to know that. I thought we had this decided when the court ruled on the directed verdict motions and on the summary judgment motions on these exact same arguments. It was found that there was sufficient evidence of extreme and outrageous conduct to go to a jury. I just think that there's a pile of things that aren't that, that they need to understand aren't that. Because, uh, yeah. yeah. Folks. Yeah. Give me a chance to reread this, please. Yes, sir. My, let me tell you where my head's at and then I'll let everybody respond. Out of these four paragraphs in, in blue, um, I, I think I would go with the defense request number three, but not one, two, or four. So my, my current thinking is we would only instruct as to paragraph three, which would include that sentence that, or that fragment of a sentence that is underlined as well. So that's kind of where I'm at. So, Mr. Altenburn, why don't you... Your Honor, I mean, the whole reason I put that paragraph in was because I didn't want what's in the underlined language to be sent to the jury as an explanation. I mean, if, if you're going to add the plaintiff's language to that paragraph, I, I, I'll withdraw the request for that because things that were, la were laid by her... Things that Maya Kowalski told her father that may or may not have been entirely accurate, she's nine years old and upset, that he takes home in this game of telephone tag and he tells his wife, and he can give us a general description of it, but we don't know exactly what we said, and we don't really know how she responded on that day because she's never been able to testify about that. How can that be evidence that makes the person in the hall that was doing these things that got them upset. That's extreme and outrageous conduct intended to cause Beata Kowalski severe emotional distress. This, this telephone line is the exact reason why a lot of this stuff can't qualify for that. So if you're going to add that language, I just want to, if you're not giving the rest of it, I would withdraw it all. Uh, Mr. Elegant, uh, my... You heard my thoughts that I was thinking about doing three, but with the underlying. Now, also qualify that with Mr. Alton Burns request to not have it at all. We're, we're fine not having it at all. I mean, Your Honor, the, all the, the extreme stuff is defined immediately above that in 410.4, 5, and 6. I mean, it's, it's all covered how bad it has to be. So. We think but the standard as, instruction covers it. As long as Mr. Anderson doesn't argue that he can take nine negligent acts and turn them into one extreme and outrageous act, that's fine. But he's not going to argue that when this case is closed. So, I mean, I'm glad to you're make it clear. closing for me. Well, I've heard your trial. <laughs> I'm sorry, but again, I, 
I want these, but if that's the ruling you're going to make, I'm going to have to, to, to say that I have to withdraw them because it's worse to give them than with that than to have them all denied. So, so agreed. Withdraw. So, given my ruling that I would do the number three with the inclusion of that underlying clause, you you are saying you want me to remove number three, and it sounds like the plaintiffs are okay with number three being removed. So I'll just cut it totally. Okay. Okay. So. Was there disagreement as to that last paragraph? Oh, the, the final language is that I don't think the concurring cause language that's standard, that they gave enough thought to this being a stress case. And so the language extreme and outrageous conduct may be a legal cause of severe emotional stress, even though it operates in combination with the act of another. I, I, I think that's, it's, clearer to the jury to say, even though the act of another or some other cause also contributes to the stress, because I think that's what they're trying to explain. You want to stick with the standard language? Mr. Uh, Elegant? Yeah, Your Honor, as a line out on the side, as Mr. Anderson says, we want to stick with the, with the standard. I mean, I quite frankly don't I mean, grammatically it's different, but I'm not sure how much different it is in meaning. Okay. Well, I'm going to go, I'm going to stick with the standard. Okay. On page 33, the, the pink box, am I reading that the parties agree? The, hmm. I'm sorry, Judge, box. Where are you? which page? Judge? Page 33, under the instruction, which is 410.7. Oh, yes, Your Honor. The phrase, during yes. the time that Maya Kowalski was a patient at the hospital. Yeah, I think we all agree on that. Yes, that's good. The side note says that Mr. Elegant says it's okay. <laughs> and I do. So that now we're going to the intentional infliction of emotional distress, wrongful death claim. Unless there was anything else on the survival claim. No, you're on. No, I think that's right. And and as Mr. Altenberg noted, he sent he sent some stuff over this morning that it I mean it kicks in at one point here. And that may be easier than trying to work through some of this once we get to that point. I agree. Well, it looks like that starts at 410.7. So in I think so. I, I had made the same uh, request on concurring cause. So I'm assuming you're going to stick with the standard language here as well. I, I'm going to go with the standard. Okay. So does that take us to 410.7 or? Yes, I think it does. I think so. Yeah, I think all that stuff in red then comes right. and the and the, all comes out. Everything before from there on down to 4.410.7. For the yeah. record, I had wanted what is in, in the current instruction, but once there's a ruling that it has to be dual, it just doesn't work. So I, let me reread this, this, this alternative language that came in, I guess, at midnight. Just give me a second to read it again. Yeah.
read this. Mr. Altenburn, is there anything that you want to tell me about this language? And I'll go to Mr. Elegant as to his thoughts about this language. Well, at some point, I do want to explain to you, you know, why it is that I think we need to have more on foreseeability if we're using the substantial factor test and explain in a little more detail why I still believe that's a mistake. Because we tell your ruling in open court earlier here, we'd always, I had at least assumed that we were making a substantial factor meaning irresistible impulse. And, and so I'm not, I'm, it won't take me long to do it, but I need to try to do that. Sure. Go ahead. You want me to do that now? I'm happy. Uh, to. Might as well. Okay. So, the and I, I've cited the, the the cases we've discussed before and taken quotes out of them. And so, in describing these, the case law always goes into the importance that there's qualitatively something different about foreseeability here, as well as causation of suicide, and. Well, I don't actually, I, I've gone through a laundry list of options with you, all of which have been rejected about what the intent should be, and, and but we're down basically now to the, the, the remaining irresistible impulse is, is more or less the same language that the plans were requested initially out, out of Nelson. Nelson is under FELA, you know, minimal negligence language, but it's it's the only thing we have in Florida, so... If we're going to use that, I've tried to put this in here in the context of a tort that is designed to only hit suicide on the rarest of circumstances, which FELA law is, if there's any negligence, you win. So that language is, has been adjusted there. But the problem with the substantial factor test, and I was thinking about this last night, but as an example, I have an uncle... Edward Gam, Mon Damon, Iowa. He was a good Catholic. He was a husband. He had two boys. And many years ago, he committed suicide. He had been on a crew of a mommer that got shot down over Germany during the Second World War, and Adolf Hitler's army put him in a concentration camp for an extended period of time. He did not commit suicide until many years thereafter, but I will tell you right now that I believe that Adolf Hitler's army was a substantial factor in the suicide of my uncle, and I will believe that viscerally until the day I die. That's an emotional feeling on my part, and maybe somewhat moral feeling on my part, but it's it's not a legal duty, and the reason that we have made suicide something that we place the duty upon the person who does it, that we make it an independent intervening cause, is because there are many public policy reasons to do that. The legislature hasn't recognized this tort, and, the, and so far the, the, the appellate courts of Florida have not, and there are reasons we do that because, again, I checked last night, the CDC estimates that in 2022, there were nearly, I think it was 3,400 suicides in Florida. I guarantee you that at least 2,000 of those families who lost a loved one will tell you, that they're, they're not going to tell you, well, it, it was all his fault. He did it. It was an independent, independent intervening cause, and it's all over. As human beings, the first thing we think about when someone commits suicide is, well, what caused that? What was the trigger? Why did, why did Mr. Bill do that? I, it, and, and that's, I think, good therapy for us to try to search for those things. And, and as from a, from a preventative standpoint, something that the government should work on to try to keep people from committing suicide. But... You know, the Kowalskis clearly think that DCF was a substantial factor. They think our client was a substantial factor. They even probably think that Judge Hayward was a, a substantial factor. And I'll tell you clearly on the record that Judge Hayward played absolutely no part whatsoever in what we're dealing with in this case. But if we have an instruction that goes to the jury and, and you know, 
that says on the verdict form, uh, we've modified this, that the Um, did John Hopkins All Children's Hospital through the intentional or reckless acts of its employees engage in conduct was sufficiently extreme and outrageous that it caused Beata Kowalski excuse me I'm reading the wrong one that did the employees commit extreme and outrageous conduct that was the legal cause of severe emotional distress that was sufficient to be a substantial factor in Beata Kowalski's suicide. If we ask the jury that, just like the 2,000 families who's, who, who have to believe that it was something else that was, that at least something was a substantial factor, that's the analysis they go through. That, that isn't the law now, it shouldn't be the law, and so the, I believe that we should not give this, but if we do, we need to emphasize at least that for the law, this has to be something that's foreseeable, where the person can say while they're doing the conduct, yeah, you know what, this could cause him to commit suicide. So what? That's reckless disregard. But unless we have something very, very strong on this, when we give them this thing on the verdict form, they're going to do exactly what those 2,000 families are going to did last year in Florida. And, and we'll have lawsuits down the road not just this one now that's the first in Florida. We'll have lots of lawsuits about this if this becomes a law. So I, I, I want a jury instruction that's as strong as possible at least, even though, frankly, I guess if one is weaker, it's better for me on appeal. But I, I, I feel obligated to get one that's as strong as possible. Uh, Mr. Elegant, on the comments that Mr. Altenburn just made, any response? I, I'm a little unclear. Was that going to the part that talks about the second test you will apply? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. I don't think we have a problem with the wording of the paragraph that starts the second test. I have some issues with some of the stuff above. Uh, I guess I'm, I'm talking about the more generalized comments that Mr. Altenburn, before we get to the specific language, I mean, he, he, he's looking at this and his argument was at the conceptual level. Well, yeah, yeah, we talked about that before, and and I mean, I th there's some things that I would do differently. I mean, I I you know we had talked about whether it could be a rational decision or not, and that's not in here, and I'm not going to ask for for you know for for that. Um, I, I mean, I th I suspect we've all been either families or friends that have been touched by suicide, and it's a it's a you know a tragic situation, and it's uh, you know, but I I think here, I mean. The jury will decide if it was a factor or not, and and I don't think it's automatic. I mean, it's it'll you know be based on everything they've heard. So, uh, you know, the way the verdict form is going to be broken down, I don't we'll have to see what the exact questions are. But there's going to be one question for the irresistible impulse, and there's going to be one question for the substantial factor. And so later on, and I think you already said this yesterday. Later on, if the if the appellate court decides it's one and not the other, then the, they'll have the guidance to sort through that. So. Um, well, let, let me just make a, a couple of observations uh, about Mr. Altenburn's comments, and then we'll get to the specific language. Uh, what, what, I, what I'm hearing Mr. Altenburn effectively make is a, basically a slippery slope that we're going to open up the floodgates to uh, and basically energize a previously almost dormant cause of action and under that cause of action um, will now recognize a whole panoply of situations that previous to today Florida law didn't recognize. I think I, I just want to push back and disagree with the fundamental premise. First, we're talking about intentional conduct, not negligent conduct. The case law already builds in a check on the issue of whether the conduct itself is appropriate for uh, taking it to the jury. 
as we all know, under the Stedman case from the second DCA, the element of outrage is an issue of law. And I think that's a very important safety uh, valve in the intentional infliction of emotional distress because it allows a trial judge right at the beginning of the case on a motion to dismiss can weed out any claim that does not rise or doesn't plead uh, facts uh, such that um, the conduct does not meet the intentional uh, standard, the outrage standard. For instance, when I was assigned to the uh, parents of the Gabby Petito versus the parents of Brian Laundry case, the very first motion that I heard was a motion to dismiss the intentional infliction of emotional distress on a claim that the facts did not rise to the level. And obviously I disagreed and I denied the motion to dismiss, but the point is the check of the emotional uh, or the, the conduct is something that the court can address right off the bat. You don't have to do any discovery on it, and it doesn't uh, open up floodgates. So I, I just would push back because I think the existing case law already builds in the, the protection against what Mr. Altenburn is effectively trying to argue. Now, I, I it breaks my heart to hear what happened to your uncle, Mr. Altenburn, and, and there are countless number of, of families, um, both in that uh, war and, and other wars where there's just brutality. Um, I actually would consider what Adolf Hitler did to be probably the most outrageous I've ever seen in recorded history. Um, so I think his conduct would qualify uh, under Florida's intentional infliction of emotional distress. And, you know, under a substantial factors test, I think your uncle uh, perhaps would have had a cause of action against uh, the Third Reich and Adolf Hitler. But that is, besides the point, um, I do believe that Florida law does recognize the substantial factors test uh, as well. And so I do uh, believe we're going to keep it on, or I, we are going to keep it on. So having said that, let's get to the specific language um, in these instructions. So, I, I, uh, Mr. Altenberg, do you want to like, talk about specific language? Well, I mean, I, I, I started off the, um, I mean, I don't think the first paragraph is in any different. You had, you had wanted and ruled that you wanted the sentence that John Hopkins did not need to specifically intend the conduct of its employees to cause B.A. Kowalski to commit suicide. So I've placed that there. And then say that, however, the employees of John Hopkins All Children's Hospital needed to engage in extreme and outrageous conduct with the actual intent to cause B.A. Kowalski severe emotional distress or with reckless disregard of the high probability of causing B.A. Kowalski severe emotional distress. I, I put that in there because, because we jumped from a finding in the previous count, the, this instruction doesn't have the, the issue language about the, the intent to cause the severe emotional distress. And especially if we have the sentence what, about what it is they don't need to intend, we need to repeat what they do need to attend. Do you mean and act? Yeah, extreme and, and she says I mistyped something here in However, the employees to engage in, in extreme and outrageous conduct and yeah I, missing well, a word and is that what you meant yeah the act should be and with the actual intent correct? okay and and with the actual okay. intent and I, I mean I think, believe that's a correct statement that's and and it should be given and then I jumped to in most circumstances, the law treats an act of suicide as an unforeseeable as unforeseeable and requires a person to respond be responsible for their own act of suicide. That that's a true statement of law. And, and if, once we're going to jump to this one, I believe they need to understand that, that this is an exceptional circumstance, and that provides that. So as a result, in order for the hospital to be liable for the death of Beata Kowalski, you must find that her suicide was a likely result of conduct of the hospital's employees, which is 
probably more generous than I would like, but I think that follows the turquoise language. And that and then I follow this with there are two tests that you will apply to decide this issue. First, you will use a test called the irresistible impulse test. I'm explaining this a little bit more because it's unusual to have two tests. I think they need to understand that. Because responsibility cannot be placed on someone for a suicide committed by another person who could reasonably be expected to resist thoughts of suicide, this test requires you to find that Beata Kowalski committed suicide as a spontaneous decision brought on by an overpowering urge or desire. And that is right out of the standard English language definitions of, of something that is an irresistible impulse. The extreme and outrageous conduct must have been have driven Beata Kowalski beyond the point where she could rationally decide against killing herself on January 7, 2017. And that's based on the language that actually the plaintiffs requested earlier out of Nelson. The second test you will apply to decide this issue is called the substantial factor test. When someone causes another person to suffer from severe emotional distress, that stress is not always enough to make the person who causes the stress responsible for a suicide committed by a person who could reasonably be expected to resist thoughts of suicide. That sentence is too long, but I couldn't manage to shorten it last night. This test requires that you requires you to find John Hopkins All Children's Hospital is responsible for Beata Kowalski's suicide only if you find that the severe emotional distress created by the conduct of the employees of the hospital was a substantial factor in bringing about her suicide on January 7, 2017. Uh, I've not included a definition of a substantial factor in this. I suggested some before, but frankly, they all went back to irresistible impulse. But I, I do believe that if the court is going to do this, there ought to be some definition of a substantial factor. I, from the case law, I just didn't quite know what to do. Uh, Mr. Elegant, anything? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Um, I, I think we're fine with the first couple paragraphs. Um, in, I would say our main, my, my main concern is the words in the fourth paragraph, the paragraph that starts there, two tests, where it refers to a spontaneous decision. Uh, that we don't see that in any of the case law uh and what and really logically it doesn't make any difference if you you know if, if these things happen over time and it builds up um you know i guess the decision when you when you ultimately do it is always spontaneous but the concern we have here is that the defense will go in and say oh well look she she thought about this for a day or there's evidence she thought about it for a day or whatever that that does that should not relieve a defendant if the defendant does cause it or they are a substantial factor or they are, they lead to it, that should not relieve the defendant because it, because the person waits a, a day or some period of time. So the spontaneous decision we really object to. Um, the, as the, the paragraph that starts in most circumstances, I mean, that's, that's, that's basically just telling the jury some law. Um, you know, I, I don't know. And it's, it's, it's sort of repetitive of what comes after it anyway. I mean, the, the, you know, the, in order for the hospital to be liable for the death, you must find her suicide was likely conduct of the hospital's employees. I mean, that, I, mean, I don't think we're offended by that, although it is again, repetitive. I mean, they're, they're told several times you're in this and above it, that the hospital has to have been responsible, um, or been a contributing, you know, substantial cause. So I think those are the those are the main concerns I have there. As far as trying to define substantial, as we pointed out in the in the other set, I mean the standard jury instructions that they say in the comment we use substantial because it's a commonly under <laughs> or substantial or substantially because it's commonly understood. I, I don't think it needs a, a further definition. I mean obviously we could look at you know something, but I mean I I think it speaks for itself. And there's you know they even cite to like a a really old case that came out the year I was born <laughs> for the definition, so or the, or the reference. In, in, uh, uh, in response, the, 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 yeah. Let, let me tell you what I'm going to do, and then I'm going to give everybody one last chance to say anything. When it comes to the intentional infliction of emotional distress, wrongful death claim, I'm not going to announce. I'm just going to 
adjust the language and, and send it out. I, I think it's going to be easier for me to do it that way than trying to articulate here with all these different pages and, and whatnot. Uh, but if there's anything else you want to tell me about intentional infliction, not, not the damages, we'll, we'll talk about the damages in a second, but the actual instructions up to damages on IIED, wrongful death, then go I, ahead and say I, it. I have responses. Listening to his argument on, on the third paragraph, what he's really saying is he doesn't want you to read the sentence. In most circumstances, the law treats an act of suicide as unforeseeable and requires a person to be responsible for their own act of suicide. I, I just, A, that is exactly what the law is, and B, it's critical for this jury under, making this decision to understand that that's normally the law and that, that they're working on an exception to the law. So I believe that that's very important. As far as whether an impulse, an irresistible impulse is spontaneous, that's what Webster's Dictionary says it is. When, when you go buy the candy store and you just can't resist going in to buy the candy, it's an irresistible impulse. And this is a very different circumstance, but it's still the same. And, and moreover, their own expert, who I keep wanting to call Dr. Roberts, but his name is Dr. Richards, said that most suicides are triggered by an event that occurs within, I think his, his number was, the range ended at 72 hours. And so it, even their expert, I'm not sure where, where spontaneous ends, but says it's something that occurs because of a trigger that takes place in, in, in the near time period of the suicide. So maybe there's a lesser word than spontaneous, but the notion that it has to be something that isn't, thought about for a long period of time is there. I mean, this woman wrote apparently two drafts of a suicide note and then another one. We have, we have two sets of these in and she put together an elaborate way to do this. And, that, and the jury needs to know that, that that's an important concept here because in trying to decide whether she could resist thoughts of suicide, she did an elaborate plan. And that's, so this is very important. And then um, on the definition, you're talking about the definition for concurring cause. And I, I'm, I'm not giving you a memo. I probably have memo, memoed you to death. But that has to do with damages rather than the causation of something like suicide. And so the fact that we have used it for many years in a combined jury instruction that was intentionally designed by that committee. I was on that committee. I know what they did on that. It, this is a case where we need something separate and distinct for the causation of a suicide as compared to the damages that flow from that suicide. And, and on a side note, uh, there was discussion a couple of weeks ago about not using the word irresistible, but I think it was uncontrollable. Uh, uncontrollable. I would still prefer that, by the way. Yeah. Um, so, Mr. Alligate, anything further? And then also maybe um, commenting on the word uncontrollable instead of irresistible. Uh, nothing further as, as far as the words go. I, I think the case law that we were referring to uses irresistible. I, I know that the case law says irresistible, it's, but... Actually, it's a mixture. Most of the cases that are are under this intentional infliction use uncontrollable, but the FEL case and the, that started it uses irresistible. And, and I, I just wonder if the word uncontrollable is better understood than irresistible. And, and, and in particular, because their expert tried to turn it into a psychological concept, I still believe uncontrollable is the safer word to use. As long as we don't end up with the defense then arguing that our expert did not testify to that specific <coughs> term, but rather irresistible. Well, well to me, to fair. me, the, the words are synonyms. It is. It is. I just didn't want there to be well, inevitable motions or objections coming from that judge. I'm, I, I'm fine with either one, but I, I tend to agree with the court that uncontrollable probably defines it a little bit better under these circumstances. Anything else? I, okay. So, sounds like I think Mr. Altmore wanted uncontrollable also, right? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm, at this point, I, he doesn't want, want to claim. I, 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 I get that, but <laughs> as, as long as it doesn't change what it takes to be, it still needs to be a, sponta a spontaneous thing that you do in this fashion. So I, I'm not changing 
the language other than you can change irresistible to, to uncontrollable, but the rest of it is, is what we need to have in there. Yeah, I'll make that decision ultimately up to the court. Let, let's talk about uh, the damage component. I don't think there was a disagreement as to the damage, but just want to make sure. I don't think there was either. I talked to him on my computer. They I lost battery? It. Yeah, no, no, no. I, it, I had to go back in and do the safety check. Huh? So, okay, I'm ready now. Uh, so, so there's no, no disagreement as to the uh, survivor damages? I believe I, that's I, all I, standard language and accurately entered at this point. Okay. I think so, Your Honor. And the next issue is on pages of 43. And you want to, the primary contribution language again? That's the only thing was the, the objection you, you have denied a couple times. Yeah. I, I, I think that's probably coming out. Well, I, and then finally on page 45, uh, for, for the one with the Ada Kowalski, it's not so important because it's survival damages. But 501A2, which they put in here, starts with any bodily injury sustained by, and, and that's really kind of backwards of this tort because... Okay, I'm sorry. See, sorry we're, we're on Maya's IIED claim now? Yes. Okay. And it's page 45 of the top paragraph. You award damages for any bodily injury sustained by Maya Kowalski and any resulting pain and suffering. Well, this tort actually reverses those things because it's a tort for creating emotional distress. So it, it ought to be for any emotional distress and for any bodily injury. I mean, if, if they proved it, which I'm not sure they did, any bodily injury resulting from that would be what would happen. Kind of like a physical manifestation stemming from the stress? I'm not sure. I, I'd like to, s to see the language and think about it, but this language is not it. Yeah, I don't Mr. Elegant, any it's, thoughts? It's, it's an emotional uh, I don't think I have anything to add on this. We took out we, we took out a reference to disfigurement um, as not being within the evidence. I don't think I have anything. Is the issue here whether bodily injury stays in? Or no, whether it comes before or after the the mental anguish, I think. I think it's, it's how to phrase it. Yes. And I'll, I'll, I'll think about it, and I'll, I'll, you'll see what I end up doing, hopefully tomorrow. I would hope and or. <laughs> mental and or, by the way. Well, okay. So that takes us to 47. Yeah, and that a highlight was only I wanted to show you where the, the lawyer talking to witnesses is, and it, so it's... It's going to be on page 47 in that spot because you didn't want to put it up front. And then, and then, then the blue language is non-duplication language. I, I wasn't sure where to put it, but that seemed like it, initially I tried to put it up front, and that didn't seem like the appropriate spot, so I put it here. There's no standard language on this, but I've used language very similar to this on a number of occasions in the past. How are we going to just to, how is the jury supposed to take this when we are separating out damages for individual torts and be able to accurately comprehend where one start starts and the other one stops? I, I do not agree with language other than a very general statement that to the effect that this is a pretty general statement should not. Well, I, I'm open to something more specific, but we've, we've got false imprisonments and batteries taking place simultaneously, for example. And, and his whole goal is to, to, to maximize the damages by getting them to award multiple things over and over again. And, and these things, <laughs> hospital, hospitalizations, that every time she goes in the hospital, it's going to be for all of these things, according to him. Right. And so they, they have to have non-duplication so that... They, they think through the fact that if we awarded hospitalization or lost wages for this last claim, how does that impact this claim? Because they go through this series by series. I was always for the idea that 
if you took a set of damages and if any one of a series of causes of action awarded the same damages, you had those damages. A decision has been made. We're going to do it separately. I do not want the jury out there confused about, well, we awarded this much for this. Now, how am I going to separate the, the, right. the mental anguish from this from this? It seems the, like an the, impossible the, Mr. task. Mr. Anderson, I need that. to rein you in, man. I... The, this, this, this is appellate talk. This is not in front of a jury talk. Let's just get this. I, conceptually, I I'm okay with the concept of non-duplication. I'll, I'll look at it a little bit more, but I think some sort of statement that Mr. Altenburn is suggesting is probably appropriate. And I'm, I'm okay. wide open to any alterations or changes you want to make on this because, again, it's not a standard one, and this case is more confusing than normal because there are so many claims. And, and your honor, I, I would note that in the in the jury instruction, or excuse me, in the jury verdict form, we have a, I think we have a couple different ways of wording it maybe, but we have a, a non-duplication instruction in the verdict form. Yeah, I, I, I've seen that. So is there anything else on the jury instructions? Because I think that was the last one that I saw. Not to my knowledge. It, just to the best of your ability, you should avoid duplication or something to that Okay. I, I will have some sort of non-duplication instruction in there because I think it's important. And I think it's the jury needs some direction on it. That being said, I think we have now dealt with the jury instructions. Our next task would be the verdict form. I would propose that we take you know a five minute or so break since we've been at this for an hour and 45 minutes. Okay. Any objection to? No. no. We have unanimous agreement <laughs> that we're going to take a break. Five minutes. <laughs>
seated. Uh, Your Honor. Hold on a second. Go start. I need to get my computer uh, unlocked here. Can't even see you yet. Okay. Sorry. Uh, there you are. Uh, could uh, Mr. Whitney is out there somewhere in a waiting room or something. Could you let him in? Because some of this damage, uh, the damage questions that we have, he's going to be more familiar than I am. I will promote him to a panelist. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's not quite the military rank that I'm sure he's <laughs> familiar with, but in, in Zoom lingo, that gives him almost okay. all access. Hey, any promotion is good. <laughs> Mr. Whitney is, in fact, a commander in the uh, Navy. I, I'm aware. <laughs> Doesn't he fly uh, fighter jets or something like that? He flies nothing that cool. Including helicopters. <laughs> helicopters. 50,000 parts going different directions at the same time. In any event, uh, there is Mr. Whitney. Sorry. Okay. Now, uh, let's go to the verdict form. Let me make a couple of general observations. Um, I don't think the following observations are going to come as a surprise to Mr. Altenburn since he has had a previous case with me and he knows kind of um, how I like to format things. Uh, but I'm going to be very specific after each question, what the jury needs to do, go to number whatever. The directions. And, and it's going to be a, it's going to be very clear. It's going to add length to the verdict form, but the ultimate goal and hope is that there will be zero room for misunderstanding. Now, that's the goal. If, if when you see what I do, if you think it interjects any hint of confusion as to what the jury needs to do, let, let me know and flag it for me. Yes, sir. So I, I will, in the version that I hopefully will get to you Friday afternoon, that will be included. Now, I will also attempt to mirror the language that we use in the jury instructions on like medical care, nursing care, and all that. If I've pulled something out for a specific claim, I will try also to pull that exact same language out from the, from the verdict forms, such that the two should mirror each other. Again, if I fall flat on that, highlight that uh, for me. Um, I, I do like the, the change back to kind of what, what I was thinking that we would do liability for, for punitive damages right after false imprisonment and then a separate punitive damage liability after bad. It, did, it, I, just I, didn't, I, it, didn't, it didn't work the other way. When I, yeah, I, I, when I, I think it has to be this way. Now, I, I want to ask very specifically as to the following. We'll, we'll use false imprisonment as an example. There are three different instances of false imprisonment that plaintiff have claimed. <coughs> the verdict form as it was presented by the parties would allow if one, two, or all three are checked, yes, uh, would allow for a singular damage line instead of a damage line for each specific separate battery. Is that what both sides are specifically requesting? Yes. I, I've had discussions with my client about whether we needed to itemize everything and make the verdict form even longer for the jury. And the decision was that for false imprisonment, we would just have the economic, non-economic breakdown and not more than that. So that, and I... Economic, non-economic, and then under 76A, the, in the past and to be incurred in the future. Well, yeah. What's required. Well, the, okay. The economic, and then you have non-economics, and the non-economics are divided further into... Okay, the, the first question is, is... There, 
it, the compensatory damages are being aggregated for all issues of uh, false imprisonment as well as separately for, for battery. My, I just want to make sure advertently that each side is requesting that it was not be, because what, what I don't want to have happen is I don't want either side to say Judge Carroll did not have specific line items and there's no way in the world I could not determine that, let's say the jury picks uh, on false imprisonment two of them and then the appellate court reverses as to one but leaves the other. I don't want the damage award coming back at me because of the lack of apportionment by claim. So I'm fine if both sides expressly say that that is what they want and they're going to lose any ability to say that Judge Carroll did not give me a, a specific line item for that specific false imprisonment. And so I, I, I just, I'm fine doing it this way, but I just need both sides to set, tell me that that is what they want. For the, well, go ahead. I, I'm, I'm thinking because what, what you're saying is that if, for example, the second district held that there was no false imprisonment between October 18 and October 20th because of the fact that she was still in a room just like her other room and probably didn't appreciate that she was being restrained at all, then if they check that box... If they, let's say if right. they check the box, yes, there was a false imprisonment between October 7th and 13th, right. but no, there wasn't a false imprisonment for October 18th and 20th. Yes, there was a false imprisonment on January 6th. Okay. Let's, say, let's say the second DCA cuts the January 6th finding but leaves the October 7th through 13th. Mm -hmm. um, the verdict form as read would not have right. a damage. So effectively, it wouldn't matter mm -hmm. if the appellate court reversed as to one so long as there was one remaining. And I think you're right. And as a result of that, I think I need to have separate damages for A, B, and C. I think it has to be laid out separately for each one. Okay. We object. We object. We think that, again, we're getting into this area of overlap, and we're willing to take the risk on this, that the damages overlap sufficiently in a category now of false imprisonment such that even if one out of them is eliminated, or even two of them are eliminated, it's not really going to affect the overall amount of those. I'm going to separate and put additional damage lines because I, I think it's important to give the jury the ability to award damages for the specific conduct that it finds to be a battery, assuming that they were to find it. Um, we'll, we'll definitely include some sort of non-duplication language. Um, and that way, it also gives the appellate court the ability to know what the jury was thinking um, if the jury comes back with any sort of uh, yes finding. I mean, if they come back with a no finding, it's an it's a academic issue at that point. Well, n note our very... Uh, I, I, I hear that you want less, less damage lines on the verdict form. I just don't want, I think it's going to breed confusion. I think it's going to breed questions. And I really don't think based on the history of Florida law, it's going to make that much difference because we always had in our, in our verdict forms a number of different counts. And as long as there are the damages here, if there are any one of them that supports that, there's a, there's a basis. Well, I'm more of a fan of interrogatory answers and more information in my world is is better and whether that if it, that helps or hurts it kind of is immaterial to me i want information we ask the jury to make findings and that's what i'm going to have them do that they'll earn their pizza or or sandwiches that they that they get for their lunches and dinners and, and as a result of that i'm going to need the same thing in battery for a and b 
Yes, sir. We, we will recast it yeah. such that... Um, Are we talking about this language? No, he has ruled. I'm sorry, on battery of Maya Kowalski, that, is that already determined? It's going to be and the other two employees? 2A? Two yeah, well, I, I, I was only talking about conceptually what I was going to be doing oh, okay. for the verdict form. Right. I right. haven't gone to any specific language. Okay. Was from a structural standpoint. We have some non duplication language down below. I, I, I saw that, and I will. You, you'll see what, what I do. And again, I, I'm hoping to get this out to you all on Friday afternoon. That, that, that would be my hope. Now, Let's go if there's specific language that someone needs to address. Ms. Paul just pointed out something to me that would impact the language, the same language in the jury instructions, by the way, but she has a good point. The, the, the two other employees have been re referred to in front of the jury repeatedly as the, as the two bedside nurses. nurses and probably would be less confusing to the jury if we if we called them bedside nurses rather than other employees? The, the only testimony I'm aware of, Judge, on these photographs is that it was Kathy Beatty and a bedside nurse in the morning and Kathy Beatty and a bedside nurse um, when she came back. So I think the jury might be confused as to who you're referencing yeah. if it says Kathy Beatty and the two other employees. I, I, I don't know that they're going to connect that. And I think if we change that to bedside nurses, it would be clearer. It's my suggestion. Okay, well, we don't agree. There's evidence from Maya Kowalski about being dropped by the this is no, 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 that's not in this case. This is, we're talking about the battery. We're talking about the photographs. The session. photo session or sessions. The, yes. Her, now, her dropping in that room is two, not a battery. Three. Go, go, Mr. Anderson, go to page four. Question 2A. That's what we're... I think Ms. Crowell's is. Yeah, I just think that, that could, they, they might, I think they're going to be confused by that. There's only been bedside nurses discussed as being in the room. I, I am conceptually fine calling them bedside nurse, but here is, okay. here's a slight wrinkle. Okay. Maya Kowalski, again, That's one. has taken the position that there were not two photo sessions. No, I, and that there was only one. That's and, true. But I, I guess... She also talked about there was one photo session, but there were two different hands. Yeah. But, but the second hand, she says, is Kathy Beatty. Right. So maybe it could be Catherine Beatty. And the bedside and, nurse. And, and any other bedside nurse. And any bedside nurse. Or, yeah, yeah, any bedside nurse, cause, because we say it's two. She says it's one. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to talk yeah. over. Yeah, so maybe did Kathy Beatty and any by bedside nurse commit a battery on January 6th? That makes sense to me, Judge. It takes out the numerical issue. I, I like that. Yeah. We object. <laughs> We're micromanaging the facts of this. My job is to make a very clear instruction and verdict form. I We're talking about batteries. The only evidence for the photo session, even from your own client, was Miss Beatty and the nurse. So I don't see why it's a problem to, to refer to it as a bedside nurse. And I like how Miss Crowell's couched it so it also avoids the one, or one two. versus two photo session yep. issue. Okay. So uh, I'll, I'll recast for that. Judge, just, just in response to uh, Mr. Uh, Anderson. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I retract. Never mind. Okay. There are other issues with language. I think there's some questions, Your Honor, that Mr. Alton Bernard raised, like on page two, on different elements of damage within the 
the, the, the economic, non-economic. And, you know, maybe, I think Mr. Whitney might be able to speak to that because I'm not as familiar with the evidence. Okay, well, well when we talk about the uh, aggravation and, 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 and that language, I was going to mirror it to what the jury instructions were going to say. Are there other issues that I need to to address? I'm not, I, we took out the word disfigurement. I, I, I guess the simplest way would be if, if, if there isn't anything, the jury's just not going to award for it. I mean, they, they know what they've heard. Judge, I'm sorry. I've lost where we lost where you are. Page, page two. It, it, it should line up with whatever is left in the in the, in the jury instruction. And so yeah. when you change that, if you can look at this, it should line up right. with that. that. That's what I was saying right, right at the beginning is yes. I'm going to attempt to mirror what is in the jury instructions over to the verdict form. And that it would be my intent if I fall flat on that. You know, I need you to highlight that for me. But right. my intent is... If I make the change over in the jury instruction, it should flow to the verdict form and mirror uh, in the verdict form what is in the jury instruction. I would, I would note, by the way, on page four, the blue and the red are for the kind of two initial non-duplication languages that were being used. And there's something like that in, in all of the affected counts. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure it did get repeated. Okay. I, I, I will, you will see what I do if, okay. if we need to take out some non-duplication language or add in additional non-duplication language, you will get that opportunity. So, um, and, and your honor, I, I, what I was trying to do is figure out, and I really didn't succeed at this, figure out the red line is what, it's what we would propose, and to put it someplace near near the beginning, maybe the first time, and then be considering a second round of damages, so it doesn't get repeated all the way through there. That seems going to just make it longer. And so, if you want the red, the the uh, defense wants the blue. I think that's correct. Are there other language issues we need to address, yeah. Ms. Carlos? On the battery, under battery? Wherever, let's just... To be, to be. To be. When it says, did Catherine Beattie commit one or other batteries on Maya Kowalski at other times described in the testimony, makes it a given that it happened? Yeah. I mean, that's that's saying, you know, as, as described, did she do it? And so I think it, if there's going to be a question, I, I didn't think she was sued for any other battery other than the putting on the lap and the... Uh, photo. So this makes it sound like she did it. Uh, so I think that at other times described in the testimony is uh, endorsing I was that that happened. I was struggling with what to put there because it's a this is the one that actually you, you didn't uh, direct a verdict on for punitive damages. The, these are things that happened over the hundred days where she says she was touched and didn't like it in her room. And I think the only that. one was, the, I thought the only one seriously was putting on her lap and hugging her. No, it's alleged as two different things. When we specified the, the, the points of battery, that it, she, it was alleged out to three things. The EEG room, which is gone, the, the things that were in the chapel or somewhere else that... All right. Were, and okay, I hear you. So, but can it just be, did she commit? I, I don't know, but I, I, I'll look at it. I, I, I hear the concern. Okay, okay. All right. Because, I mean, it, it was, the allegations are this took place in the chapel. I, it, what it, I'm, I'm really flexible on that. I didn't know what to put down there. Uh, if I could comment briefly, if, if the court would, when considering it, look to paragraph 79. We described unwanted hugging, patting, stroking, slapping, caressing, and kissing. Some of those things occurred in a room. Some of those things occurred in and around the vicinity of the chapel. Yeah, so, I'm not uh, looking to limit it to the chapel or, or, or the room. I just didn't like the as other times described. I'll look at, at paragraph 79, and perhaps if that is a complete roster of the allegations, then we'll 
substitute that, that roster of allegations. Um, but what's next? Is are there other language issues as to any I think on page four, page six, Your Honor, the med mal. It's the next one I have. Under C, I was I was concerned about a little confusion there. Health provider other than Sally Smith, for whom John Hopkins is legally responsible, and, and you see the comments out inside it. It's it's it admits it's responsible for all others. So I I don't think we need the for whom it is legally responsible in there. I'm not following what you're asking me, Mr. Elliott. Six C. No, I'm there. But what okay. what are you trying to get think, me to say? I think delete the language beginning that says for whom John Hopkins All Children's Hospital is legally responsible. Because that's redundant. Because wow. they It needs to be. So I understand the response. I'm oh, sorry. Sorry, my, my, my apologies. I I I thought they were admitting they were responsible for everybody, for, for all the healthcare providers other than Sally Smith. Well, it needs to be not Dr. Hannah or Kirkpatrick. I mean, it needs to be tied to John All Children's Hospital. Well, that's the only claim. Right. Well, the testimony's been, though, about other doctors doing other things. And but they didn't see her in the hospital, did they? Okay. They didn't. I just want to make sure the jury's interpreting the question to be during the hospitalization. And, 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 you know. Maybe that's the way to say it, then. Well, what, what about one or more health care providers... Um, employed by Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital because all these other people that, that, were, that were legally responsible for it there's, are actual employees. Well, but then figure that out. Yeah. Were one or more health care providers employed by Johns Hopkins, comma, other than Dr. Sally Smith, which gives the impression that Dr. Sally Smith was employed. Yeah, we don't want that. Yeah. <laughs> How about just say during the stay? I go back to what Ms. Carls was mentioning earlier. Just well, I can't give an impression that Sally Smith was employed by Johns Hopkins, especially since I'm telling the jury that she wasn't. That the only question is whether she's an apparent agent. Right. Right. I think what Ms. Carls was saying in the in C, if we took out the for whom John Hopkins is responsible, but put in there someplace during the stay at John Hopkins All Children's Hospital were one or more health care providers okay. other than Dr. Sally Smith negligent. Okay, then, then, then how about can, from a conceptual standpoint, if, if the jury checks the box that Sally Smith was not the um, apparent agent, then there would be like an instruction, a sentence on the on the verdict form that says, uh, for this next question, you may not consider any act by Dr. Sally Smith. And then do the, was there one or more healthcare providers um, neg, you know, were there one or more health care providers negligent in the medical care of Maya Kowalski? Something like that. So if the jury has just checked no that Sally Smith is not the apparent agent, the very next question that they would have to answer would be uh, in inclusive of some sort of instruction saying they can't consider Dr. Smith for it at all. I think that's what happens with the way, if they work through it the way it is now, the way Mr. Altenburn drafted it. I think the only confusion is in paragraph C. I mean, if, you're, if Your Honor would like to try something so we can look at that, that I yeah. understand what you're going at. And, and, and it, it occurs to me while we're discussing this, I don't know how Mr. Anderson plans to argue this, but 
we might need to say, other than Sally Smith and Catherine Beattie, if, if there's going to be any suggestion that she was a health care provider, because she's well, not. I think we might need an instruction that Kathy Beattie is not a health care provider. Right. Um, I think you have flagged the issue for me, and you'll see what I do. And then you can propose alternative language if you feel it's, if I fall flat. Anything else on language? I was unclear on, on page 7, the blue. Oh, well, maybe that was me being tongue-in-cheek. <laughs> Probably not appreciated right now. <laughs> so I think I can delete the. Yeah, you, you, your rulings are such that you can delete that. And I, and I think that then with the, with the instructions, if you down on the next thing under four, you harmonize that with the instructions. That's probably a better word than yeah. mirror, so harmonize. I will attempt to harmonize. <laughs> That's just conforming to the damages, I think, right? But, but page 11 does have... Um, um, I, I note that in, in 6 on fraudulent... It's, this says fraudulent misrepresentation. It should be fraudulent billing. Or, well, it, it is a fraudulent misrepresentation count. But uh, Mr. Elegant never put a damage line in that one. I did not either. Okay. Should, should we change it to billing? That's the only thing that you're going to they've heard billing. It's going to be billing. Yeah. Okay. But, and, and then I'm not quite sure how you're going to do the damages on that. We'll see you on Friday. <laughs> see if I can get it finished. on page 11 oh. that that'll mean that'll need to be reworked in light of the rulings on the instruction right but your honor I think one thing we agree on we talked about yesterday is that there would be one line for uncontrollable and one line for substantial factor you know one question for each of those Yes, yeah, so an, inter an, an interrogatory uh, option, yes or no. Yeah, and it's set up that way now. It just needs to be reworked or harmonized. <laughs> Anything else? Not sure. I, I don't think so. Just uh, it. It, it, the lines for the damages are not big enough to put a letter in, <laughs> let alone... I'll write. make them smaller. <laughs> <laughs> we agree. This was a rough formatting. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I thought there might be humor involved in that. Judge, I can negotiate the link here. <laughs> Judge, um, but, but I'm not going to make it uh, landscape to make it uh, <laughs> an eight-inch line either. It only needs to be half the page, Judge. It will be fine. <laughs> Judge, outside of this issue, there's one exhibit issue that needs to be resolved, and I see Mr. Yeah. Whitney's here. Okay. Is there anything else on just, on verdict form before I just, pivot to something else? The only thing I would kind of highlight for you is that the tran 
from intentional infliction survival, you, your instruction on where to go next, it, 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 I, I've done a bit on that, but it's a little complicated because if they answer no, they jump all the way to Maya's intentional infliction, and if they answer yes, then they go to the next one. So it, it, that just needs to be done. I think I got it, but I may, you may think it could be done better. Oh, uh, wait a minute. Could I, they, they should be answering both survival and wrongful death. Absolutely. E, e, n no. If they answer no to survival, they don't get to wrongful death. That's what our instructions tell them. Oh, you're, you're, talking about, you're talking about the top of seven. Right. If there's not enough emotional stress to cause survival damages, then there certainly is not enough to cause wrongful death. So you, 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 you jump on those. Now, at the end, if you get both, you're going to have to elect. I think I know which one right, you right. elect. Right, right. Elect. Elect the <laughs> Yes. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Well, I, 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 I knew what he was talking about. I'd rather have them both answer. Anything? No, there's nothing more from our side. Um, and to confirm, you're also going to read and give them a physical copy of the the dependency order instruction, or instruction that was done before. We, we weren't asking for any changes. In it. Uh, that was my intent. Okay. And oh, okay. I'm sorry. I, I, is that going to be read again, the, the 10 page thing? Yeah. That, I thought that was just going to be given to them. Well, I, I guess theoretically I could just give it to them. I, I had told you before that, that and I, I, I maybe you should defer to count, trial counsel on this, but it, it, it's going to take a long time to read these things. They've heard it once, they know what it is, so as long as you tell them that it's what it's there and if they need to read it again, it's there, I, I'm not going to object to that. It, it's, a, it's a 10 minute read, so yeah. it's not the end of the world, but it does take some time. We had a couple of additions to the dependency orders, Your Honor. Well, send those to me specific language that you were asking or to be deleting. I think I had circulated the word version of what I actually read. I believe I did. You did. And, I, and if, if they have additions, I haven't seen anything about that to this point. It's, it's going to be so much easier if you send like a legislative style, you know, add this language and strike out this language to the actual physical word document. It's so much easier to see what it is that you are asking for, or whatever the issue is. So please do that, and then um, let's talk for a moment as far as timing, and then we'll pivot to some of these other issues. My hope is that I will be able to get to the lawyers sometime late afternoon on Friday. My goal is to get uh, my draft of the uh, instructions and the verdict form to you. It all depends on how long that meeting goes and whether I have Wi-Fi in Wesley Chapel or where wherever I, if I have to pull into a, you know, Starts. Cracker Barrel or something <laughs> to grab someone's Wi-Fi. I'll, I'll, I'll make it work somehow. It's just, I don't know when I will be able to do that. But my goal is to get it sometime Friday afternoon. Assuming I can get it to you Friday afternoon, uh, would you be able to get to me um, any suggested changes? Additions, alterations by let's say three o'clock on Saturday. I have no problem doing that. I would want to confer with Miss Crawls if you're going to be yeah. available. Yeah, yeah that, like that should work fine. And then I would try to 
get back to you any sort of further comments to your suggestions or rulings or by I would say hopefully around noon on on Sunday okay. and then if there was anything further that you would get it to me by let's say 8 p.m. on Sunday night so that I'll have those last minute points so that when we walk in on Monday morning, that they should be pretty much um, finished with maybe possible, you know, a knit here and a knit there. My, my, and my only concern at all is that I know Mr. Shapiro on our side and Mr. Anderson on the other side are preparing closing arguments and, and, and displays for the jury and whatnot. I don't know how much, if we do too many changes on this in this time period, it may impact people's adjustments to, to their closing yeah. arguments. My, my, my hope is the... I'm betting by 3 p.m. on Saturday we have something close. That's we're, what we're, I, I think that, and then on, you know, Sunday, you know, the, the, when I forward something at noon... We're probably going to be relatively close. Yeah, if there were there were substantial changes at eight o'clock on Sunday evening, I have a feeling I'd hear from Mr. Shaw no, about that. And, <laughs> and by giving you the opportunity to, to file something at eight o'clock, that doesn't mean you need to. It's just <laughs> you know, right. it, it's just if there was something else, um, so that I'm not caught flat-footed Monday morning because Monday morning is going to be tough enough. Um, as it is. Yep. Okay, so any questions on the timing before we pivot? Okay, so let's pivot. Ms. Croyles, you wanted to talk yeah. about something? Mr. Whitney, um, I, I, uh, you're there. I, we asked, it's the one exhibit, we have a couple of minor exhibit things we're working through, but the, this one, uh, the plaintiff has, has admitted and they want to redact some things that we uh, disagree with significantly. I don't know. Can you put up, are you, are you set up uh, to put up an exhibit number? Uh, 2408. If I could jump in for a minute, if it's all right, if I'm, I think I'm done. Your Honor, if I'd be excused, I've got to get to that seminar. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your time. Do you have the highlighted copy uh, from Mr. Uh, Whitney, that you could show what he wants to redact? I'm not sure what page on 2408 are we referring to. Okay, so um, it's, it, I can just describe it, or Mr. Whitney can. But um, I received, an, if you can put it up, I, I received an email from Plaintiff's Counsel uh, highlighting what they want to redact um, on this, and we disagree because we think they're all admissions with respect to things. So. Mm. What page on 2408? Oh, I'm sorry. 1738 and 1739. So this is uh, in evidence, Judge, and then you may recall plaintiffs said, oh, wait a minute, we want to redact some things after it's already been admitted. They want to redact, starting from on the first paragraph, a woman from CPS showed up to the end of that paragraph. I don't know if you want to just take them one at a time. But I do think it's important you well, read it well, in that, context. Doesn't that go to her knowledge as a parent agent? Yes, exactly. So that's going to stay in. The next one they want to redact is on page 1739, the paragraph, second, well, it's the first beginning paragraph, Tuesday M1011, that paragraph. They want to object, uh, redact. Obviously, at that time, Dr. Vose or one of her associates already notified CPS but didn't tell us anything about it, so we were blindsided again. I'm less concerned about that. Is this, just so I'm, is this, oh, so this is on, on the 11th, this isn't on the 13th? Correct.
that's the only sentence they're asking to redact on that paragraph. The one that starts with obviously at that time, Dr. Bose. Oh, so they would leave in the 10 people in the room and police officers in the hallway? They, they want to leave that in, yes. Mr. Whit what's your thought on that? Yeah, the, the overarching goal of these redactions is to keep out chapter 39 issues. So this is indicating another a report or another report. Uh, the jury is aware there's a report. The court's made a legal determination about there being a reasonable suspicion. So the reporting of Dr. Vos is not for the jury. And I, you all are moving quickly. I'd like to go back to the first paragraph. We don't have to do it right now, but at some point. Well, I'll give you an opportunity to say what you want to say, but it, that first paragraph goes to uh, Beata Kowalski's knowledge relative to uh, Dr. Sally Smith and the apparent agency issue. So I'll give you an opportunity in a moment, but sure. I'm pretty confident on that one. Now, on this Tuesday AM paragraph, I don't see Ms. Crowell's what that sentence that Mr. Whitney is trying to have or that, what issue that well, goes to or defense that that goes to, it, it just seems um, an unnecessary reference to the chapter 39 process. Well, I think the context is important for her comment about there were police officers in the hall and security person. Um, it's, it's not they're not saying the police officers are there because they want to leave against AMA. They're saying they believe the police officers are there because it's been reported to CPS. So fine if we want to take out the comment about there were two police officers in the hallway and security person. Because she then says, obviously, they notified CPS. It wasn't. But the, pro but the problem is I've already in, in, in instructing the jury that it wasn't until the 13th. So. I, I don't see how that sentence gets you anything. Okay. And so I would agree that that sentence comments on a Chapter 39 issue. So I am fine uh, excising out the obviously at that time sentence. All right. The Mr. next Whitney, one. Hold on a Mr. Whitney, say what you want to say about that page one comment. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Um, page one, it says a woman, it says women, but. Uh, grammatical error. A woman from CPS showed up here. It does not identify that woman as Sally Smith. Um, if you look at the second page, it says the same woman from CPS came back. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm kind of jumping around here for your honor. I, I don't think it's clear on the first page that the woman being referred there, to there is Dr. Sally Smith. So that sentence, a woman from CPS showed up here. I think it's unclear. And the next sentence, we were totally blindsided. Uh, yeah. Understanding the court's uh, view on that piece as to apparent agency, I, I have a, a bigger issue with the next sentence, which is we questioned what this is all about. And we were informed that this is a standard procedure in ICU when a child is on so many different medications. And then it goes on to discuss the laws in Florida diff being different than Illinois. Well, well so, my, my understanding was you were only... Ms. Crawls was only talking about that one sentence. Oh, no, I'm sorry, Judge. If, uh, uh, no, uh, he, they wanted to redact. Uh, I thought I said the entire sentence oh, after that. I, a paragraph I just after thought that. it was that one sentence. No, I'm sorry. They wanted to redact. Let me make sure it's clear on the record. The plaintiffs are requesting to redact the remainder of the paragraph, beginning with a woman from CPS showed through and her meds. Well, that's a different, different. Okay. Okay. So where does, when you say this paragraph ending, tell me, Mr. Whitney, where your paragraph, what you claim the paragraph, where it ends. Yes, Your Honor. We would request that it be redacted from we questioned what this is all about all the way through. There were a lot of questions regarding Maya's RSD, CRPS diagnosis and her meds. We believe the entirety of that goes to first a legal conclusion. Secondly, Chapter 39 and uh, invades the court's 
uh, ruling about there being a reasonable suspicion and the, and the jury doesn't need to consider that. And then the questions regarding Maya's RSD, CRPS diagnosis and her meds goes straight to if it's believed that this one was Sally Smith to her investigation and report, which have been kept out at all other times. I, I continue to believe that the sentence, a woman from CPS showed up with two police officers to investigate what's going on, uh, needs to stay in because it does speak to the apparent agency issue. Uh, but as far as the arrest, Ms. Crows, do you want to say anything? I do. I, I think I understand maybe that we questioned this thing, but the sentence anyway, she, CPS questioned Maya independently than Jack and me, needs to believe stay in because that's again indicating that they knew the woman was from CPS. Uh, and then there were a lot of questions about her RSD, CPS diagnosis, and meds. That's Sally Smith. So if you want to take out the middle of that, we questioned through different in Florida. I, I don't, I, I have no, I don't care. But anyway, she questioned my independently than Jack and me is clearly referencing uh, Sally Smith. She, uh, I, I can agree that any ways she questioned goes to a parent agency. The next sentence, however, there were a lot of questions goes straight into chapter 39, her investigation, her opinions. I, I will agree to redact the paragraph starting. We question what is this all about through the remainder of that paragraph, which is laws different here in Florida, question mark. So that comes out. The sentence, anyway, she, paren, CPS, in paren, question my independently, then Jack and me stays in. The okay. next sentence is out. Okay. All right. I think I have a hard copy of this. I should have been making notes. I've got notes. I'll, I'll, I'll recirculate. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wayne. Anything else on yes, page one? No, Mr. not on page one. Because... Not on page one. No, Your Honor. Okay, so I've already ruled about something on page two. You did. Is... You you ruled on uh, the paragraph that begins Tuesday a.m. You have uh, deleted or redacted. Obviously, at this time, that time, Dr. Vos or one of her associates. Yes. That sentence. What what else on this one? That's in dispute. The paragraph that starts, the next paragraph that starts Tuesday, 10, 11, late afternoon. Mr. Whitney would like that sentence. Well, I can modify based on the rulings that are being made here. Okay. Well, go ahead, I Mr. Would, Whitney. I would agree that Tuesday, 10, 11, late afternoon, the same woman from CPS came back because of second, I don't know what CEO is, from hospital staff. I think it should end there because the next clause she received i don't know ceo that we wanted to take maya ama to take her home that's a lie that goes to the chapter 39 reporting uh, <laughs> I, I think that goes to the false imprisonment claim yes exactly your honor so that that sentence has to remain in mr whitney all right uh, understood the next one your honor is if you move down Halfway down that paragraph, there's it begins Tuesday, 10, 11 evening. I have another supervised, supersized visit from Sally Smith. All right. I need to read this to myself for a moment to decide if, if consistent with the court's rulings, it's going to remain. I think that first sentence supersized visit through to investigate this child abuse neglect case would stay consistent with the court's rulings here. But then I think the one and a half hours and the investigation and the questions she was asking and how are these administered, all of these things are straight into Chapter 39 and Sally Smith's investigation report, which has been previously excluded. So I would suggest that this, the balance of this section from I spent one and a half hours down to the end where it says when she first spoke with me, be redacted. My only comment on that, Judge, is I believe Dr. Smith testified that she spent, I could have this wrong, but I thought she testified that she spent one and a half hours with her. So it'd be clear that this would be the same visit that Dr. Smith talked about. So we could just say, I spent one and a half hours with her and end it there if the court is concerned about the rest being a description of her investigation. I'm not concerned about the sentence I spent an hour and a half um, 
it, it also reinforces the, the question of uh, apparent agency. So I would excise in this paragraph, uh, starting with Chi Smith asked a lot of questions. And to where, Judge? I, I think it goes all the way to when she first spoke with me. Well, if we're if we're to arguing that this is all relevant to a parent agency and her role as a treater, then I'd like to keep the last sentence. FYI, she didn't know anything about RSD CRPS when she first spoke with me. Well, that goes to the investigation, Judge. If we're going to leave that in, we got... Well, I mean, to be fair, it, it is a statement about her, her knowledge base, and there is a question of apparent agency. Okay. So I, I would leave in the FYI. So I would redact starting with she, Smith, asked a lot of questions all the way through with her presence and will be questioning you. Anything else uh, uh, on this exhibit? And then the last one, Your Honor, and thank you for your patience, is in that very next paragraph. Today went through Wednesday. Someone from CPS visited Kyle. Then CPS showed up unannounced at my home. I think those are Chapter 39 issues. I don't think you're – yeah, that, that can come out. That's uh, it, Your Honor. Okay. Nick, you'll cool. send that to me shortly so I – have it in my head. Well, well, well top, top, time out, time out. Sorry. What, what about the next four or five lines? I think the ICU person who reported us is doing this. Oh, yeah, that needs to come out, Judge. Thank you. Well, no, I disagree because the jury is aware of the reporting. But that that that's, goes to directly against the judge's ruling that it was done in good faith or reasonable cause. And it's not an issue for the jury. I then. All right. Go ahead, sir. Go ahead, Mr. Uh, Whitney. I, I, I understand. If that's the, and it seems like the court's leaning that way, then I think it should pick back up. It. I cannot tell you how devastating this is to us, Dr. Hanna. That goes. I, I'm okay with that, but we need to, to to take out the sentence starting with "I think the ICU person." Yes. All the way through Munchausen by proxy. I've got it. And so, Madam Clerk, how do you want this presented? Do you want this as an A, or do you want it as a separate trial exhibit number? Is that replacing what we already have admitted? Yes. Okay. Um, but, but, but we need the unredacted version so that it can travel with the appellate record. So okay. do, you, do, you, do you just want to just make this... Uh, one three one seven three eight and one seven three nine as mark for identification and just have an A. Yes, sir. So would it be two four zero oh, eight A seventeen thirty nine and seventeen uh, seventeen thirty eight and seventeen thirty nine? The A goes after two four zero oh, eight. Does okay. Go, does it go after the two four zero oh, eight or does it go after the seventeen thirty eight? Uh, after the seventeen thirty eight. Okay. Okay. So. Okay, the, so so 1738A and 1739A okay. will be admitted, and the A version will be as redacted as we just, and then the regular 1738 and 1739 will just be ID'd, but not admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. Mr. Anything Whitney, I, can I just ask Mr. Whitney a question real quick, sure. Judge? I know you've got a lot of things doing, but can you get that to me fairly soon? <laughs> because I want to look at it while it's... I didn't take good notes. Well, it's fresh in my head. Sure. We'll have it to you within an hour. That'd be awesome. Thank you. Uh, um, I, what's the, the next thing, Ms. Uh, Corrales? Uh, I don't think there's uh, – uh, uh, I could be uh, corrected, but I think um, otherwise the exhibits are in good shape. You're missing a couple things, right? Yeah, I, I believe – as of today's date, we're missing two exhibits. That we're going to get to you by Monday. Right. And then we're missing uh, oh. a couple from the plaintiff. Right. Yeah. I don't know what else is going to come in Monday morning. And, and also, do we have the Excel? Yeah, I didn't give her the actual Excel until it's finalized. I just gave her printouts. 
not the actual thing. But and I get a. Oh copy. yeah, I have an extra copy, Judge. Thank you. But um, my other question is, um, I haven't heard any feedback on the language, so I'm assuming we're fine with the description of the exhibits. I don't want to be told Monday morning that we need to change the description of the exhibits. I looked at it and initially it looks fine. Okay. I, I want to, if we have some additional questions on it, we'll give you a call, let you know in the next couple hours. Yeah, as long as I get it by, by sometime Friday so I get some assistance in correcting it. And, and I do want to get out of here and start back to try to figure out how I could possibly put all of this into a closing, but um, <laughs> not to say it'll be yeah, a, You have way too much time. You've got <laughs> three and a half days. <laughs> For just two I hours. I don't even figure out the jury instructions in three and a half days. I just remember the old days when we'd go from last witness to closing based closing. on sticky notes. I exactly. Uh, uh, judge, I had a... Uh, well, 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 go ahead. Was there anything else, Ms. Crowes? Uh, no, I don't think so, Judge. I'm going to hand you this copy. But I will note It's a copy. I know. It's a copy. Oh, yeah, I was going to check with my, my uh, co-counsel. I didn't think 3325 had been admitted, but they say it has. I was just going to check with my co-counsel first. Okay. I may be totally off base on that. Um, and we know this column needs to be made a little wider because it cut off some numbers. Okay. Okay. And, 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 you, know, you can always wrap the text for no, the... It, no, it, it just needs to be made slightly wider. But, but yeah. I'm talking about for, for the row, sorry, the column to the right... The description, you can wrap the text so that, if necessary, it can go to right. two lines. Yeah, Allison's got it. She's, she's, she's wrapping. So I'm just trying to find an ex, that extra copy. I, I feel like I have shown incredible restraint about not taking over the Excel spreadsheet. I, I, I've been impressed <laughs> with, with, the, with the restraint. I don't have it. Oh. I, I don't have it. So I think Ms. Crowell's is finished with her stuff, Mr. Anderson. All I wanted to do, Judge, the reason I've been hanging around, is I wanted to deliver to the court and perhaps mark for identification a letter, January 31st, 2019, uh, to Kevin Sowers, Interim CEO, Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital, that deals with the 2018 report and the results of it. And we are hopeful, although we haven't received it in time, if I may approach and give right. it to the court. Well, it, well, I don't want to get into that, Judge, without... If there's something you want me to read ahead of time, just give it to me. But file it separately with the clerk because Michelle. I don't have time to have the clerk mark it and me get a copy of it because I need to get out of here. Yeah. So whatever you're giving me, I'm not putting in the court file. You're going to have to separately file with the clerk what you're giving me. Yeah, I, I will. Now, has the defense seen what you're giving me? Yes, I gave them a copy. Okay. Judge, I don't have an extra copy right now because I wrote on this one. I need my notes. Okay, well. Natalie, can I can email you one. Can you just make a copy of the. Natalie's just going to make a copy of the uh, Excel spreadsheet and she'll get it to me in a couple moments. Yeah, I gave two up there, Judge. Okay. Your, well, your Honor. Ahead. Mr. Whitney, you're next. Uh, and I'm going to bug out. So I'll. Um, you, you, you might want to hang for just another moment, All right. Mr. Whitney. Yes, Your Honor. If I could just comment on uh, what Mr. Anderson just delivered to you. I, I won't go into the detail. But I, my question is, at this point, we have been delivered some documents uh, regarding this joint commission issue. We have not been provided all of the documents that would exist, including the critical September 2018 immediate jeopardy report audit finding, however you want to classify that. So the question to the court is, recognizing it's Thursday at 11 a.m., how would the court like us to address this issue if we believe that there are insufficient documents being provided? My, oh, Ms. Crowell. I was going to uh, read what's been provided was the CMS notification 13119, the CMS survey 11119, the final accreditation report 81418 to 81718, get some done recommendations 62619, and the CMS revisit survey 22119 final. I didn't hear the self report in there. I, I mean, here is, and I want okay. to be very clear about this. Okay. 
I am interpreting my instruction to turn over stuff very broadly. Okay. Very, very broadly. Okay. If there is a scintilla of odor, it needs to be turned over. Okay. And when I say it, scintilla of odor, anything having to do with the run-up to this um, report, all self-reports, you know, any prior um, surveys by the Joint Commission slash CMS, because I, I heard that Mr. Hunter say yesterday, well, there was a prior triannual survey that we passed with flying colors. You want that? How far back do you want to go, Judge? Because I... Well... Let, let me ask this, and, and maybe you don't know this. I might not. Did anyone lose their job over, over this issue? Like, is this oh. when the, the hospital president My understanding no longer became hospital president? Because of the heart issue that there was some, yes. I, my, I vaguely understand. Yeah. Keep that with a grain of salt. I vaguely understand that as a result of the heart issue, there was a cleaning of house, so to speak. Well, yesterday, Mr. Whitney said that the documents say that this it was not confined to the Heart Institute and that it was system. Now, obviously, I'm not in a fact-finding position at this moment, but yeah. I, I need to at least assume the possibility that the reports are going to show more systemic than just heart related. I mean, that's, I think what the plaintiffs are telling me that the media accounts are. I that understand it's, that's the allegation judge. Okay. So knowing that I'm, I'm not making a finding of fact, but it sounds like there's an allegation and perhaps the media also have made statements that it's not just the heart. I don't know. I don't know. Just saying, you, you know, this thing just kind of got dropped on me yesterday. But, and, and all of this, but, these events are taking place. After the events in this lawsuit, well, okay. right? I, I'm about ready to get there. Okay, because okay. it does sound like the chief executive lost his or her job over this. I believe that's accurate. And so, when did this chief executive start being the chief executive? Is this when start being the chief executive? Yeah. Is this when Johns Hopkins took over All Children's Hospital? I don't know the answers to these, but I'll take the notes. Be, be, because if we're talking about something that is systemic, something that, that becomes pervasive and systemic doesn't happen just overnight. It, it, it's a culture that is created. And so is it when this president came in, is it, is it when Johns Hopkins took over the All Children's Hospital? Is that when... The systemic problem started? Judge, my understanding is that the, I forget the acronym of the organization that. Joint Commission? Th thank you. <laughs> joint Commission. That the Joint Commission report, I mean, they're, they're looking for the documents, but that the Joint Commission report that was done in 2018, that they passed, and it was after that that the hospital self-reported the issues with the heart stuff. Well, let me ask you this. Was there media accounts that predated the hospital's self-report? I don't know the answer to that. Meaning, in other words, did the media bring this to the attention and then the hospital self-reported? I don't know the answer to that. But in my mind, if, if, if this is an issue of systemic hospital problems, and again, I don't know. I haven't seen any of the reports. And all I'm going on is what I'm hearing in court. But if there is a systemic problem, if this president lost his or her job because of this issue, I kind of want to know when that president became the president. Because if, if we're talking about a creating of a culture, the inquiry does the creation or is it, does it start with that president? I don't know. I, I don't know, Judge. I think that this is sort of going off the rails a little bit. I mean, the issue in, in this court for this jury is about whether or not, as I understand it, when the testimony was given that 
this hospital passed the, I'm sorry, the name keeps escaping me. The Joint well, Commission. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank God. I'll write it down. When this hospital, uh, when there, that, that, that there was testimony that they were accredited by the Joint Commission. And then there was an issue raised by the plaintiff, but that ain't true. They, in fact, were on this double secret probation or whatever. Um, and so that, that's what started this, Judge. And so now it's become a deep dive into years and years of this hospital. Well, I and think so what started if the is Joint when the Commission. Defense, what, I think what started is when the defense uh, presented evidence before this jury that says that the Joint Commission had blessed well, Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital, giving a what possibly is a very false impression. Well, Judge, so that's... And not just the Joint Commission, so also federal agencies. So that's the issue. So if, in fact, the Joint Commission in 2018, which would go back over the years that are involved here, passed the hospital, and then it was only after that that this issue came up with the heart stuff then we were, in fact, accredited in 2016, 2017, when this is a thing. So to go back and deep dive into the whole hospital seems a little extreme for the issue that this is addressing. Well, I just fundamentally... I can answer a couple of the courts. I, okay. I, I, I feel very strongly at this point that a deep dive is not only necessary, but is required, and I'm directing it. Okay, so I don't it has um, to happen immediately. I understand. I'm just not clear what the court what the court is asking for with respect to time frame and also what documents. Well, again, I'm asking when did can I get when I did this president become president? I don't know the answer to that. But if we're talking about something systemic that was a culture that was pervasive through the hospital, then I need to know. Uh, how long uh, senior leadership was involved, because if we're talking about the creation of culture, it generally starts from the top down. Now, sometimes but, it's bottom up, but that but seems to be something that I need to know. But isn't the first threshold question, was it systemic before we have to dive deep 20 years or however many years this guy was president? Well, isn't how am I going to make that question? determination? I think the reports would make that determination and the, and the, and the deposition on Friday. And, and you're, you're, I don't, I don't have any more hearing time between now and the, when we walk in on Monday. Well, I feel like I can't address the court's concern. I have, I do not have the knowledge as to when I this can. guy became president. Okay. Mr. I can Mr. Whitney, when did this person, well, who, who, who are we talking about the first time? Who's the president? Jonathan Ellen. He okay. was brought down from Baltimore after the acquisition. When was he the was, acquisition? The acquisition, I believe, was 2011. I might be wrong on the date. It's 2011. Okay. okay. So, so, so when, when Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital took over All Children's Hospital, the fellow who lost his job became the chief of All Children's Hospital. Is that what, what you're telling me, Mr. Whitney? Yes, Your Honor, except I can't represent that he immediately became the president at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital upon the acquisition. I can only represent that between the time the hospital was acquired by Johns Hopkins and the time that Maya Kowalski was a patient there, he had become the president and was the president during the relevant admission. So so I can find that out, Judge. So, so why don't we do this? President. Whenever that person became president. 2012. That's, oh, 2012. That's the date range. And, and you're looking for the Joint Commission report from and, that date and, and forward. And the federal agencies, however they interact, interact with each other. Okay, I'm not. I, I'm just. I'm not trying to be difficult. That's kind of vague, but I'll. I'll report it. I, I am doing the best I can. Again, I, I. I am going to take a very broad view of discovery. So if there's any hint that it might be relevant to okay. this concept. It needs to be turned over. I, I am going to look on very disfavorably if I come in on Monday morning and I get a list. Well, you know, I didn't get this report from, you know, 2017 because I didn't use the proper language in my discussions. Because I hear, I'm hearing the court judge and I'll, I'll do my best to articulate this as described. Your, your Honor, if I can inquire 
only because I kind of missed how this became a thing in this trial. Very quickly, I'm, I'm, d does this relate to the punitive damages for false imprisonment and battery? Does it relate to the negligent training? I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure I understand why we're doing this. That's all. I, I, I just don't know what issue it, the, it triggered all of this. I, I, just trying to figure out. Well, what triggered all this is the defense presenting an impression in front of the jury that the Joint Commission has blessed all children's ho or Johns okay. Hopkins All Children's Hospital and basically said everything was fine. And that possibly is either a correct statement or a materially false statement. Okay. Very materially false statement. All right, I understand the court uh, directives. Anything else on this issue or can, can I? As long as we have some date certain, time, sir, time certain today by which we would know something. Well, I, I don't know what that means. The, I, I think we've got that a the, deposition the, tomorrow, the, right? I, I would say that the bait court's comments have expanded the materials that we thought we were producing. So I need to get that information. I'm not sure I expanded it. I just well, was. Well, we went back in time. Enforcing it. So. We have to have a little bit of time to go through these documents before we depose them. I, I've said what I'm going to say on it. It's an expansive, given the, the position we find ourselves in and how this came up. Um, so. Let's talk about how Monday morning is going to shake out. Yes, sir. Because I also, am I getting a, a motion to disqualify one juror or two jurors or three one. jurors? One juror. Okay. And um, that's going to be filed today. Yes. I want to first, when we walk in, I want to first address the imminent jeopardy finding issue. Okay. That's going to be the first thing we're going to do. And any sort of follow-up, my, my hope is that if, if there's any further testimony that has to be done, the, the plaintiffs are, are ready to, to bring it. Yes, so sir. we can end this case you know, a few minutes after we we call bringing the jury in. The second issue I think we need to address will be the uh, juror issue. Yes. And whether we do that before or after the yes, jury, I, I don't know. It just depends on how long it takes us to deal with the first issue. Understood. And then um, the next issue after that would be if there was any sort of remaining jury instruction issue we probably have to address that issue as well. My hope is we won't have anything at that point. Do either side see anything that we also have to address? So long as the admission of additional exhibits falls within that first category of discussing immediate jeopardy, no. When, when, when you talk about admission of additional exhibits, I mean, is it going to be tied to either the the initial jeopardy issue or that one policy that we talked about yesterday that's what you're talking about that's what i'm talking about your honor yeah because you know I, i'm not I, i'm not seeing this as a we're, we're just reopening up discovery or, or evidence on on other issues because that's not understood. what we're doing understood okay, anything else on that I think so. no, your honor. okay I think so. Thank you all very much. I will see everybody on Monday, but I'm sure we'll be in communication via email uh, over the next few days. Thank you, Judge. We are in recess. Thank you, Judge. Judge, we have all of the...